Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Goaty Conversations for Friendly Fire for 2023. Uh, they're a little bit late. What's everybody pointing at? Pointing at me? Preston's pointing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was very confused. I thought, I thought you were like pointing, oh, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Oh, right, 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 like, right. Oh. I guess that would indicate typically like a, hold on. <laughs> I was just pointing out of excitement. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, we will, we will cut none of this. Um, <laughs> uh hello we're a little bit late this year we had scheduling conflicts but um if you listen to our emoji conversation you already know tom and tyler recently just like left the discord and we're over in draft punks now so between ryan and i it was a lot easier to pull a couple people together and schedule this thing get it done um and 2023 was one of the best years ever in video games so i feel like it is it's important for us to come together and talk about it so that we can all digest it together as a Otherwise, it's just going to take up room in my head while I'm trying to enjoy 2023. Yep. Yeah. 2022 and 2023 have both been pretty good because all the COVID games finally came out. <laughs> right. Well, that was the big thing about it was wating for that and feeling... I mean, 2022 was still really good, but it felt like everything was It was 2023, yeah, for the most and, part. But once it all did happen, it was almost an overwhelming... It definitely was an overwhelming amount. Like, I'm right. glad to feel like i can take a break from the games i, I yeah. not feel like it's a back-to-back hit bang yeah you know i can focus on prince of persia which has been great uh yeah, but not feel good. like pressure to move on to the next thing i yeah. mean i don't know for me it's like there's print there's prince of persia and then there's tekken and then there's relink and persona 3 and then there's going to be Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still yeah, pretty it's still, close. It's still pretty crowded. It's crammed together for me. But... Even just, I mean, I, I love Prince of Persia. I managed to platinum that in a week. I played like a ton of it. Um, but now I have like a dragon, which is going to take like 100 hours or something. Final Fantasy VII yeah. seems like it's going to take 100 hours. Even if Do I you... only play a few games, they're all going to be forever long this year. Like, Do you have a running list? Um... Well, I know you do. Uh, how many games did you beat, Chris, in 2023? Well, way less than the previous year. I know my number was ridiculous really? the year before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I started like uh, dating and having a social life and stuff. So uh, mm-hmm. less, yeah, less games beat and it turns out. Um, I know that'll do it. <laughs> Who's going first anyway? I don't think you said. I did not. Preston will be going first. I'll count how many games I beat in here, but. We can, I, uh, we can get started. I, sorry, I didn't introduce anybody. I'm Chris. Ryan's here. <laughs> Hello. Genetics is here. Hello. Preston is here. I am. Ta-da. Uh, well, well, Chris is counting. I, I am also down from 2022. In 2022, I played 32 uh, video games. And in 2023, I played 20 video games. Wow. Yeah, I feel like I played more, but I'm not sure about that. Probably about the same, honestly. There was still a lot that I didn't even touch. You got to remember, one of those video games, Preston, was Baldur's Gate 3, which right, we had right, to right, schedule right. four hours every weekend for two and a <laughs> half months to get. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Like, the games, there were more games, but all, half of them were these massive, yeah. you know, right. 100 hour games that felt like you would just sink whole months into. And so even though you're still playing some little stuff in between, like you're not able to get to the smaller indie titles. I mean, there were like three different Baldur's Gate type of games that came out last year. It was Rogue Trader, I think, for Warhammer. And then I heard about one for the first time from Ryan yesterday. And then there was Baldur's Gate 3. So yeah, War Tales, Preston. You remember War Tales? Oh, that that was released last year. Actually, that year. Yeah. We should get back to that at some point. I would love to. I think that would go on my list. (laughs) <laughs> it made my moody you'll spoilers yep. mm. <laughs> uh, yeah if um, i had put more thought into my list it probably would <laughs> yeah you you bring up a very good point that like there i think there's fewer indie games that i had time for here because there were so many major releases that were massive yeah that, like exactly. there was also great indie games that people were talking about that i was like that sounds like i would love it if i had the time to play like cassette beasts like like I, <laughs> yeah, I have that downloaded and started it. It's pretty it's, fun overall. It's so good. <laughs> I downloaded Jusant last night, and that's supposed to be like a yeah. four-hour game, right? And I yeah. should have gotten to that last year, and I just 
never did. So I'm looking yeah. forward to actually finally tackling it. Um, yeah. Andrew Sant's yeah. Venom. Uh, I, I, I didn't make time for that one. I think it was the last game I beat last year. Um, That's when I started and didn't finish. Uh, but yeah, in, 20, in 2022, I beat 84 games, and last year I beat 44 games. Oh, still wow. a high number, but like... I don't even think I keep track like that. Like, games I beat, it's like fucking five, probably. <laughs> There's just too many live service games and shit that I play, yeah. so... That's fair. Um, but yeah, let's jump into our top ten list here. Preston, kick it off with your number ten. Uh, it's a game. Okay, I do want to preface my list by saying that for the most part, these are the the back end of my list are games I did not beat, um, but still really like. So they're probably better than I'm giving them credit for, but they're lower on the list because I never beat them. Uh, but it starts off with Diablo Four. Uh, mm. had a ton of fun with it, and I thought like. It was really nailing the feel, and I really went into it on release being like, this is going to be my live service game, and I'm going to keep up with this, and I'm going to keep going. And then you get to, like, level 50, and in that game, after level 50, it just screeches to a halt. Yeah. And this is all season one, right? This is on release, and it just completely turned me off from it. Yeah. But the rest of the game was so much fun, and leading up to that, and... I assume, uh, from what everyone said about it, it's gotten much better in these later seasons. And so I do want to go back and really hit that grind a little bit more and not feel the stall out. Yeah. But I, it, it felt great. It was a, like as botched as Blizzard releases always are, that was a smooth release. And it yeah. felt perfectly fine. You had queue times that were long, but like again, this is Blizzard standards here. Uh, yeah, and it was smooth. I never really had a whole lot of hitching. It played on console great right off the rip. Uh, so it it was it was a fun game. Yeah, um, Diablo Four is not on my list, but uh, I I did enjoy it. I enjoyed playing through the campaign. I had the same issues you had with like the hit level fifty. It was just like that getting Paragon points takes forever. Um, so mm -hmm. annoying. Um. And then, like, uh, I'm sure they've improved that in season two and three, but like, I played a little bit in season one or whatever as well. Like, it started a druid, and I don't know. It's just, uh, I wish they had like a mode that is like the adventure mode in Diablo three, where you can just hop in and it's like, okay, there's like five quests yeah. per location. Go jump in there, do those quests, get tons of experience, jump around, you get a ton of loot, whatever. Like, you don't have to like run around the map everywhere to do all this stuff. You just jump yeah. to where the thing is and you do the thing, yep. and it's fun. Um, yeah. I really need something like that. I also really, really hated the little statue thing. Like you have to find all these little statues to get a bunch of passive bonuses across all your characters. And if you don't, you're just kind of like gimping yourself for no reason. But yeah. it's really, really yeah. boring. Yeah. It's an excessively boring thing to do. <laughs> I am I'm a sucker for this. Uh, I am a absolute sucker for that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, hitting points on a map and clicking A. <laughs> Give it to me. Like, I, then, I'm really bad about uh, some of that kind of check. I don't think uh, I would mind it very much if there was a way in the game to, like, get them marked on your map. But you have to, like, use IGN and be like, did I get that one? OK, got that one. Did I, no, right. I got to go to that one. OK, OK, let me go over. There. Yeah, I know. That's the biggest issue. I played it only to, like, level 30 or 40. Mm -hmm. And then I started another character with my girlfriend, and we got to, like, 20 or so. And she's like, I feel like I'm just hitting the A button all the time. And I was <laughs> like, you know, you're not wrong. And then we just both pretty much stopped playing for the most part. It didn't feel like it was clicking enough for me. I don't know. It's probably just more of the general thing I always say about, like, open world vibes need a very particular formula for them to feel mm -hmm. good for me. Yeah, it didn't. Diablo 4 did not click for me super hard last year. I, I fell off before I even hit level 50 with my first scary, like maybe 46, yeah. something I like that. I played the heck out of 3, and I've played a lot of 2 as well, but then like I got to 4, and I was just like, something feels off. I don't quite know what it was, yeah. but it was fine. And then didn't help any. I was watching all the streamers play who play it just like 16 hours a day or whatever, and then they hit level mm -hmm. 50, and suddenly things just yeah. slowed down so much. Like, And they were having to they had that statue competition where the first like 1000 people to hit level 100 on hardcore would get oh, their yeah. name on a statue in front of blizzard 
And I'm literally seeing like Shroud and Asmund Gold and stuff like that have to like literally cheat the system. It's like you party up and like you all go attack a different dungeon and then you like break your party, but you all get experience. Yeah. I don't know what They're the finding exact exploits exploit was, but the fact they were using an exploit just to try and hit the max level, I was just like, I don't know that I want to continue the game. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. Blizzard also like they had to kill people, kill the way that people were legitimately getting experience in dungeons and stuff in order to like cut off that exploit, which just made grinding. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. They really shot themselves in the foot in many ways. But like I said, I hear it's much better in season two and the upcoming season better, yeah. three as well. But I mean, I'm just going to wait for Path of Exile 2 and give that a shot <laughs> for action yeah. RPGs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was I was shocked. I did not love Diablo 4. I'm shocked it's not on my list because like I, I did another run through Diablo 3 earlier this year and that was super fun or last year rather. Um, mm -hmm. Like I'll, I'll go do a run through Diablo 3 in like 10 to 15 hours and it's a freaking blast to max out a character. But, yeah, course, and I, I think getting back into it now, you're going to have a lot more of a similar experience at this point, six months after the fact. Uh, but it, it was definitely not nearly as breezy uh, as Diablo 3. Yeah. Was it, wasn't a cover girl? <laughs> easy <Not> or breezy. <laughs> it was it's, beautiful. It's, it's pretty easy. It was beautiful, yeah. The final boss <laughs> sucked in that game, too. <laughs> um, anyways let's move on preston had we talked about diablo 4 i'm glad i got to get all my hate off my chest <laughs> uh genetics what's your number 10 my number 10 is not on anybody's list i 100 it's my hero ultra rumble which is the my hero academia battle royale that came out uh i did actually put up a review for it as well but uh ultimately i just it's a fun battle royale. The battles feel like they're shorter than like Fortnite and stuff too, but it's also just like super freaking explosive. And it's more, more like if you took the concept of League of Legends and stuff where the characters have skills and stuff and then made it a battle royale rather than just like, so finding items on the map is more of like, you're finding stuff to power up your kit rather than you're finding new equipment and new ways to play for your character so you know exactly what your character can do all the time basically and um i don't know it's just fun and it feels like a simplified battle royale to a fair extent like and the main issue with it was that the shoot characters that could shoot are just the strongest ones so that's like the biggest issue i had with it but they've been pretty active on balancing it and everything and then the only other issue and why it ultimately is kind of number 10 is they tried too hard on the live service thing. They made it like a gotcha in order to pull characters uh -oh. to play as there's like ha over half the cast is available free to play for the most part, like just working through the levels and stuff. But like when new ones release, they're in a gotcha system. And then there's always three characters in the gotcha system. Once they release a new one, one will drop into being available for free to play. So it's just like the newest oh. one. That's how they're doing their monetization scheme. So it's like not aggressive, like going into like Honkai Star Rail or uh, Genshin Impact, where it's like every new character is only in the gotcha. But it's and they you, they give you enough free pools, and just through the process of doing pools, you get currency to buy some of the free to play characters and stuff. So it's not like overly aggressive, but just like. The gotcha system's weird. It doesn't feel like it was needed in the game. It feels like an executive just kind of walked in and was like, what if this was a gotcha? Yeah. Basically, which is what a lot of games are kind of running into. But And then also it's a game they're targeting like most every console. Like I think it's even on Switch. So the graphics aren't like... The, the My Hero skins in Fortnite look better than the characters in the My oh, no. Hero Ultra Rumble game look. But they still look decent like it's still good it's like probably it's still ps4 ish level almost maybe it's just it has to be able to run on the switch and i think they're going to bring it to mobile too so they're just like cutting some corners on some of the graphic fidelity but as a whole it's just super fun it'd probably be even more fun with playing others and stuff yeah i i played a my hero academia battle royale last year called fortnite oh yeah i know exactly <laughs> uh yeah, I, I have nothing to say about that one. I I forgot that he yeah. existed. Yeah, it's fun though. Like that. Uh, Brian, you're up next. 
All right, my number 10 is also not on anybody's list. It's a game you may have heard of if you heard me squawk about it last year a little bit. It is Boba. This is a a Daniel Mullins game that was made for a game jam. He made it in 48 hours. Uh, It released Mm. on his itch on like January 5th or something like that, right at the start of last year. It was like one of the earliest games you could possibly release in the year. Hmm. Uh, it is a Not like one January game. It's good for you. Yeah, uh, it's like a one hour long idle game with oh, okay. the most Daniel Mullins ass story that you could fit into a one hour ass a one hour long idle game. Like it's <laughs> it's it's wild for what it is. It's a fun. T- it's tiny, right? It's like ten megabytes. It's free. It's on itch. If you search uh Boba Daniel Mullins Boba like Boba T. Uh, you will find right. it, is it. Is it directly associated with Boba T in any way? Like, is it on, like no, comment. Mm. no comment. No <laughs> comment. Based off of looking at it, but... <laughs> yeah, but it's, just, it's, it's a good time. It's it's fun. I just searched for Boba on uh, Itch.io, and there's a lot of Boba T games on there. So search for Dan- Boba <laughs> Daniel <laughs> Mullins if you want to find it. it, it looks very yeah. different than all those Boba T games. It was... But, uh, uh, it's solid. Boba Game Jam, actually. It's all Boba <laughs> themed. Everything. <laughs> I think it was uh, game, Lud, what was it? L- Ludum Dare 52. Hmm. Interesting. Um, did you guys play it? It's, it's not on my list or my own but Did you guys play Pineapple on Pizza? I don't want to... Maybe that's on somebody <laughs> no. else's list, but... I don't know it's a very it. interesting experience, and Ryan talking about Boba remind me of it. You, you should just like look it up on YouTube. It's like a ten minute game, and I think it's free actually on Steam. So you should just play it. But it's like the creators of I Am Fish. It's just one of those <laughs> super odd, makes no sense to really have, but uh, it's you're glad that you play have it. Yeah, yeah, it is free on Steam. Interesting. Um. All right. Next up. My number 10, this is definitely on other people's lists, and it's much lower on mine than it is on other people's. And you guys can be mad at me if you like. Sea of Stars is my number 10. Um, okay. <laughs> I know you were thinking I was going to say something else. You'll probably be mad where that is, too. But uh, yeah, Sea of Stars, amazing uh, turn-based RPG. Uh, made in the West, but very JRPG-inspired, very Chrono Trigger-specifically mm-hmm. inspired. They even have the original composer Matsuda of Chrono Trigger doing some of the tracks on it, although a majority of it's Eric W. Brown, as we talked about on our Modi uh, podcast. Um, yeah, it's just like the story is unbelievable. Garl is like probably the best character of the year. Yes. Um, yeah. Even though he's like, you know, the sidekick to the two quote unquote main characters, like he's the real main character. He's the one people are following. He's the reason people are following you and care about you and your team. You know, you, they, yeah. really, like the Solstice Warriors aren't aren't the main they're pool. very boring yeah <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um and yeah the game that game is worth playing all the way through and uh doing like everything in the game just like the post game ending is it's it is a it is a treat um yeah i didn't really have any issues with it, it it's not like it's just last year was so amazing that like all of the games on my top 10 are like there's not really issues with these games they're just really great games that i yeah. put in an order on my list yeah, basically. Uh, I think Sea of Stars is probably is one of the best games from last year for sure. But um, there's just a few things that were hiccups as far as like being able to miss achievements. It wasn't super clear, like uh, for some of that like secret ending stuff and everything, like talking to certain characters and crap. They were like, they never tell you you can go onto your boat. And then one of the things is like, go on your boat. I had to go look up, like, I can't figure this out. They're like, oh, you have to get on your boat by pushing this button. And like, yeah, there's a little button prompt in the corner, but like, it's small in the corner and you're not going to look at the corner while you're navigating the world map. So it's just like, there's some little UI things that felt a little odd, but for the most part, like the game's just an old school classic while being in 2023, basically. So yeah, I'll say that. It being that old school inspired, and maybe that's why so much so much of this is like you're gonna have to look up a lot of if it's like secret ending yeah. connected or uh, it could be that. I just know those. that they uh, focus so much on they used newer technology, like the lighting and everything is really good. Oh, yeah, game, for yeah. instance, but they focused on trying to make it feel like the old school. Like even the music when you listen to the composer guy talk about it, 
he specifically tried to make it feel old school, but he was using like modern day tech to make the music, obviously. So, yeah, it's a, I think that that ended up being one of my biggest complaints with it, which was uh, getting lost in the map and not knowing where exactly I was going to go next. And uh, especially yeah. like the swamp areas, it was. Yeah. The other like one for me. Go, basically like you're saying is you go through part of the dungeon to try and get something and then you need to get out and they don't have a quick travel way to get out you have to like right. run just, out it just there feels are some weird. weird like old school mechanics there that uh obviously are intentional right um right there's so many quality of life updates that we've had in rpgs since then that it would have weird. been perfectly fine here or even as a setting right like, yeah there's so many exploration versus guided mode and just adding your yeah. spot, your, your dot on the map of where you're supposed to be going would have been just like a little uh, bit of something. Yeah. yeah would have been nice. very helpful for me and uh, probably would have helped me to get further into it. This is on my yeah. list, but it is not one that I beat. Yeah. Yeah. It's really um, good though. Yeah. I, I do. I also, I want to call out one of my favorite things in RPGs is when the, stay low like the numbers stay low which is what it does yeah yeah and uh every every like a uh, special move you do you have like a uh, an input to do like to make it stronger um which it also makes turn-based rpgs way more engaging like mario yeah. rpg or paper mario <laughs> yeah that's what i kind of was talking about in my review overall too it's like the you have to watch the turn order and then there's the lock system and then there's actually the input. So it's like a turn-based game, but like you're still actively paying attention during like oh, every yeah. single turn because you need to guard against the attacks. You need to know who's attacking next. You need to think about what you're doing with your mana, your ultimates, your team attacks. Like it's all layered in a way where it almost feels like it's an action game, but it's not. Like your mind's actively thinking about what's going on in the battle the whole time, basically. Yeah, I thought... Uh... I don't know if this was on one of y'all's lists, so forgive me for bringing it up this early, but um, that and Chained Echoes from the beginning of the year both really made like modern JRPG combat or modernized that JRPG turn-based combat, I should say. Yeah. Um, in a way that like really brought it up and made it more engaging and made you want to get into battles and not try to run yeah, exactly. Away from them constantly, which I did still do a little bit of that. Yeah, it wasn't very it. much. So. Yeah. 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 Chain Deco is this one I still need to play. I think it technically was like December, late December 2020. Uh, it was like or something, 20, but it was like, like on it was the twenty seventh of December or some bullshit. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So it it was too late to even count for like the game awards and shit too, or anybody's game of the year list. So it would count for this year for anybody. All right, let's go to our number. Preston. Sea of Stars. Nice. Perfect. Yep. Uh, genetics. Mine is, again, a game that's probably not on anybody's list. It's a, a League of Legends story convergence. It's based off of Ooh. Echo from League of Legends. It's uh, basically a Metroidvania. So it's, I don't know, it's just really fun. The art style is really good. Echo's like the main character I play in League of Legends, too. So. I just already knew a lot of what was going to happen and everything in it. And it has a lot of really fun references. And if anybody's watched Arcane, it's Echo's a part of Arcane. Mm -hmm. And so characters from Arcane act actively show up in here and characters that might be in Arcane in the future. Which they did show a teaser that Warwick's going to be in the next season, the big werewolf guy or whatever. And he is a boss in Convergence. So if you oh, play cool. Arcane, you would like Convergence. Or if you've watched Arcane and like the story and the the world telling then convergence is really fun too. And it does time travel in a way that I kind of like as a whole too, where the story just kind of makes sense and everything, but it's a really fun platforming con Metroidvania type of vibe. There's not a whole lot to say about it. It's just, if you played a Metroidvania, you kind of get the gist and it yeah. pretty much plays like most Metroidvanias, like Hollow Knight, Ori, all that sort of stuff. Just a little more flashy, I would say. Does it have that arcane um, kind of art style to it as well? No, or is it... I, I, it's hard to describe what the art style is exactly. Um, let me look it up. Real quick. Oops. It's like... Rare too. It looks I, good. 
Yeah, it looks good. I just like don't know what you would actively compare it to, really. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of something. I look mean, it's it. really look good up images, looking. people. Looks yeah, good. I don't basically know look up to. images and videos. It's like hard to come up with something to compare it to, though. I know there's something on the tip of my brain. I just can't place it right now. It's like a yeah. pop yeah. punk type of vibe. I don't know how to explain <laughs> it exactly. Like gritty, but looking pop still. So, which makes sense for Zon because it's like overly colorful ball. So being like the freaking dirtiest place in Runeterra, basically. So, but Wait. that's my number nine. Awesome. Ryan, what's your number nine? My number nine, continuing with the theme of games uh, people probably haven't heard about or have barely heard about, unless they've heard about it from me or maybe one other person in the DraftPunks Discord. Oh, Pika Yune yeah. Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm surprised this isn't a little <clears throat> higher. I, uh, you know what? There's only one reason it's not higher, and it's because I haven't technically completed this game yet. Mm. I've beaten it. And then I, I I beat it through regular difficulty, but instead of going to the ending cutscene, I kept playing. And then I've done that through Overdrive one, two, three, and four, or one, two, and three. I'm sitting on Overdrive four, and I'm like, yeah, hey, might as well just beat it when I get to Overdrive five, which is the last like difficulty modifier level. So I'm waiting to get to that point before I see the finishing cutscene. But this this game, uh, thank you, Travis J. Walter Weatherman on the Discord for bringing this to our attention. Uh, if you liked uh vampire survivors yeah then you will there's a probably... lot of good <laughs> vampire survivor clones that do this a lot this one does better. more in my mind well here's there's here's the benefits the the dad's boss fights that are bullet hells so you have more uh gameplay variety in my mind it's not just bullet heaven uh you've got the ability to decide where you're shooting it's not it's a little bit more active you don't have to you can turn auto aim on which is how i tend to play but if you wanted to control where you're shooting with the mouse uh, you have that ability. Uh, it, it, they let you just go to infinity. You know, you can if when you get to the final boss, you can choose to go back into space and keep fighting and just continue to build on your build levels after level after level after level um, and just run until your PC explodes. Um, I, I've had I've had the point where typically, you know, you're supposed to be in a level for five minutes. I, I was in a level for like 25 minutes because I was running at like three frames per second trying to set new level records over Travis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it it has light story, but it's it's a good story. You know, it's not a very yeah. story heavy game, but the story that it has is good and it's weird and it's cryptic <clears throat> and, and I love it. Um, and it it's has fantastic like break core music. Story, almost. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is very Daniel Mullen's story. It's that vibe of of weird indie game story. Um, and it's just a really good time. It's five bucks. It was made by a really small team who are really passionate, uh, and it, it's 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 a really fun time. They're still optimizing it so that it runs better and better. Uh, and and the boss fights are all fun. I think the boss fights are really fun. My, my favorite boss fight is probably the second one, where like you're fighting this uh, large worm that's like constantly looping back on you and shooting, you know, bullets you're dodging in different patterns. Uh, but as you break pieces of it away, it like breaks up into all these smaller pieces and it becomes just super chaotic. Sometimes that fight's really easy when all the pieces are like ready to go down at the same time. And other times that fight becomes chaos because there's seven five chain pieces of this worm just floating throughout the map doing wild things with their, their attack pattern. Yeah. Yeah, they like took bullet heaven and mashed it with bullet hell basically it looks like. Mm -hmm. It's a really good time, and and they put Which it over. Which I will note, last year when I said people are calling Vampire Survivor a bullet heaven, everybody was like, that doesn't make any sense, but here we are. They're, the term's getting used <laughs> because it, it makes sense. You're the bullet hell for the enemies. <clears throat> is the concept. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, but but I really love it. I, I've I've dropped a good bit of time in it, and it's got a demo if you know you wanted to give it a that's shot. Demo. If that's still around. Yeah. I think it's still up on the Yeah, store I page. see it on the store page. There's a yeah. demo for still. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely worth a look if if you were a Vampire Survivors fan. Um, I, I think it does enough to add on to it to you know, yeah, give you a it little bit more of a meal cool overall. Wait, all right, my number nine is Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Um, <gasps> too low. Wow. Too low. I don't. It's I don't higher on my list. <laughs> I mean, I barely even played uh, the first one. So. <laughs> 
It's a great game. Uh, it's um, there's kinda, a lot of good games last year. Though. Yeah, it's um, yeah, that's a sequel to Fallen Order. It's very mm-hmm. like based in Dark Souls in terms of like you drop your currency or whatever when you die, and it's pretty challenging. Um, very like uh, lethal. If you are not paying attention to combat, you will die quickly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, which I love. Uh, I love this game's improvements. Like um, the levels just feel they they're bigger, but they feel like connected better like i there's very rarely a time where i'm like i need to get to that point on the map and it's gonna take forever to do it because there's no shortcuts there or whatever right doesn't feel like a slog there's the mounts that make it a little bit easier yeah for sure um and then having like the i think it's like four different fighting styles you get and being able to swap between two of them at any time kind of customize your character more like you you can actually kind of build your character in this game uh, even though you will eventually get all the skills like at least you can only have two styles on so you are still making decisions of how to build your character for the end of the game other ones i got like double lightsabers i mean what else are you uh that was that's the weird style. thing like they would introduce some some of those styles pretty far into the game where it felt like i'm used to double like i'm not gonna do this ultra heavy uh like great sword basically style fighting uh yeah. But I still, but by the end of the game, I started using that one, and I ended up really liking it. But it took, it took a lot to kind of convince me out of some styles for a while, uh, and I don't know why I even really ended up getting convinced. I was just it, it, it's lenient enough with your skill points and with respecking and everything that you feel like you can just kind of like dive into whichever one you want to do and build. Yeah. It. Um. But yeah, also just I mean, just like exploration. That game is so fun like i I found everything other than Mm -hmm. all the little rocks or whatever like there's eight billion of those or whatever and i didn't find all those but i did all the little challenges you can find the platforming challenges and like there's a couple of them that feel like celeste seasides like they are insane like you are dashing through gates to like refresh your dash and then you jump and then you dash through another gate like it's insane i hated them there were some of those that i mean i was i there was one that was like you're hopping on rails and then going through some dashes that one was weird and I rage quit on that one so many times, but I, you know, it was a, it was enough that I went back and beat it mm. in the end, which yeah. is fairly rare for challenges like that within game. That one was weird because it was not clear where the like root was that you were supposed to yeah, take. Yeah, that's, that was that's why struggle. I didn't like that one. But. Yep. Yeah. No, I, just, I, I mean, we did, you know, we did a whole uh, uh, game exploration on it. But I, I loved Jedi Survivor last year. It's definitely on my list higher up. Um, I, everything for me is a standout in that game. I think they did a great job iterating on it from the first game. And it was just a really enjoyable experience. Love the blaster stance. To the, I, I'm so excited that they gave us a gun as a Jedi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was one that um, I felt like, like you were saying, the exploration is not only fun, but it's actually is rewarding enough um where you know the previous game you got ponchos yes <laughs> uh, in this one you got either actual cosmetics or at least the currency to get cosmetics and you could customize your character out more and so it made it worth going out and looking for stuff uh, and you would get this sick jacket halfway through the game and throw it on and get really excited or a new hairstyle um and so he started off looking um very just hillbillyish uh you know just uh, some <laughs> terrible haircut uh terrible beard and then oh, by yeah. the end of it once it got I the kind big like, full bushy beard i mean that's all i yeah. have for the rest of the game and then but then by the end of it like you kind of start falling in love with that look no matter how goofy you make him look he'll still kind of look like a badass uh mm-hmm. and so i i really like I was completely enamored with that game and with all of the technical hiccups and not hiccups. It ran pretty poorly whenever it was first released and I was playing on Xbox and had a ton of issues, but still pushed all the way through immediately. Didn't take a break on it. Really uh, put so much uh, time into it and loved it despite the issues, which I think is why it's, it's like it's it's above some of the other games on my list because I liked it despite the technical issues. Like I, mm. in my mind, that gives it a little bit more pedigree for the rest of the game. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the the story in this game is incredible. Like, uh, I liked Cal Kestis mm -hmm. already from Fallen Order. I don't know why people hated him so much, but I feel like even the people I hated him, most of them think this game redeemed him. Like, he is a better character. Yeah. But he, he was fine in Fallen Order. But uh, all, all the side characters are amazing, too. Like, a lot of the characters from the first game come back, and they introduce some great new characters. As well. And there's a, there's a moment, like, 70% through the game that is... Unbelievable. And I just wanted that moment <laughs> as you were talking about it. And it just, it, it like you brought me back to when that happened and it blew my mind and loved it so much. And then the side quests, uh, not a spoiler, I won't say what happens, but the, like the bounty hunts, it's mm. worth going through all of them for some of the just story beats that you get because of that. Uh, and it feels rewarding to go and do the side quest sort of stuff just because you get to experience a little bit more story in the Star Wars world. Oh, yeah. Let's move on to number eight, Preston. Number eight is Cocoon. Cocoon. I Cocaine. really gotcha. love this game. Huh? Cocaine is your number eight. Yeah, I just... Yeah. <laughs> it was all year. It's how, that's the only way you can play all the games. That's the only way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Cocoon is a little puzzle game that is probably about six hours uh, ish, and it's really wild in its mechanics. Once you kind of get the hang of the main mechanic, it can get a little tedious. Um, what it is is you are a little bug inside of a world, and you can jump out of that world, and whenever you jump out of the world, the world becomes an orb. And then you can carry the, that world, and then you can put it into other worlds, and then eventually you'll have this sort of like Russian nesting doll of worlds within worlds that you're hopping between and moving the orbs around to neither. And it it can get it gets to just the edge of brain breaking um, and being just on the edge of frustrating as a puzzle game. But then you kind of can take a rest, come back to it after 15 minutes, and it clicks. And it's one of those games that feels uh, difficult and rewarding just enough. And a weird note that makes it a reason why it's on my list and kind of the charm uh, that captured, captured me was <clears throat> in boss fights. Whenever you would lose a boss fight, you don't die and go to a restart screen or anything like that. You, the boss throws you out of the world and you go into this sort of like meta world. And then you have to go back into the orb, drop back into the boss fight and then keep going. But it has this like really, really great animation to show you exiting the worlds and going into the orb. So if you died from a boss and you were thrown out of the world, there was just something about the way that it was animated that just felt like not punishing. You weren't getting, you weren't going to this game over screen. You were just kind of like, all right, one more try. Like, let's get back in there. Let's jump back into the ring. And it felt really fun. It's a good game. It's six hours. And it's probably on my list because it's six hours as compared <laughs> to everything else that is 50 hours and not. Uh, and it, I was able to beat it because of that. Yeah, it's on it it's on my short list to like play next time I have a small break between games, if that time ever yeah. comes. Uh, just because it is <laughs> yeah. it is a shorter one that I could finish in a couple days or whatever. Yeah, it's it's something it's special. I don't. I want to say IGN gave it like a ten. Um, it got really really great reviews, and I don't think it deserves those reviews. Uh, I don't think it's quite like masterpiece high. But it's a cool game, and it's it's a really great time and good way to spend a weekend. This Sounds week. cool. What's uh, my number eight is Honkai Star Rail. I uh, just really enjoyed the story of it. Obviously, main problem is live service, so you get the base story, and then you have to wait for more story to release later. But I uh, was able to play it through free to play pretty easily for the most part. And I don't know, it's just really fun. This, the graphics are really good. This, it's super stylish and then like the music really pulls you into the game even more. It's just it's, like really entertaining. And they have like this fun like roguelike dungeon system to it or whatever, where you go through and like every time you go through, you can get further advancements for your team and everything. 
on top of having the story mode. So there's like you're pulling characters for the story mode, but then there's also other sub modes that you can actually make use of the characters in, which is pretty cool. Um, not a whole lot to say. It's just kind of your basic gotcha, gotcha live service nonsense turn based sort of thing. But it's Genshin Impact, but I feel like they improved upon what. Genshin Impact mm-hmm. was kind of lacking as far as like actual end game, actual like things to do. At least early on, it lacked things to do. I feel like they've actually yeah. gotten somewhere as far as like, and because it's turn based, I feel like it has the opportunity to be flashier because like since it doesn't have to be action combat, it doesn't have to have the greatest readability. They can actually like go in on the graphical design of like what the characters are doing and stuff rather than just like you have to yeah. be in control of your character all the time and know exactly where they are and what's happening and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, like, like a dragon, a series known for very flashy heat actions, the turn based ones are still 10 times flashier because you're just yeah. watching a long animation, you know, you, have to, you like, don't have to get like, back into the combat after that. Yeah, exactly. Which is part of why I like Honkai a little bit more than like Genshin and stuff like that. And I didn't even get too much into Genshin. Again, it's probably just the open world Breath of the Wild vibe of it just like turns me off a little bit. But I always wanted to because of the graphic style and Honkai Star Rail being kind of like, not I wouldn't say straight up Final Fantasy 13 with like hallways and stuff for the story. But it's like very linear, like this is how you get to the story. And then you go into the roguelike mode and it's similar to like, not Hades vibe per se, but like the way you progress through the rogue, like it's it's rogue light. So there's actual like progressions mm-hmm. you buy outside of the game to make yourself stronger with the next time you attempt it. So there's like an actual story linear mode, and then there's this more like open but not fully open like rogue light side to it. So it makes any investment time wise or whatever that you put into the game actually feel a little bit more worth it because you just go and do a run here and there every now and then or whatever. Um, Ryan, you're up next. Number eight. My number eight is a little indie game. I don't know if anyone heard of it last year. It's called Dredge. Oh yeah. Mm. Uh, really freaking good. I absolutely love the atmosphere of this game. It was a gameplay loop. I wasn't expect. Well, I don't know. I guess I probably should have expected to fall into it. I I, I do a lot of do enjoy a lot of those work sim video games. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it just just the the story and atmosphere are so good. Uh, you know because you, you hear fishing game you're like oh fishing game but like ha- having it with set with this very uh deep sea horror back you know backdrop to everything is is great uh make sure if you uh ha- you know have played this game and haven't to uh see the true ending you know make sure you you go see mm-hmm. all the way through uh because i i do think that you know puts a very nice bow on the game where the regular ending doesn't put a nice bow on the game <laughs> but uh i mean it's great you get you know fishing with like uh retro uh retro rich resident evil style inventory management with your fish yeah. you know it's, uh, yeah it's just it's a solid time it's a good time yeah uh, and they it's... make every fishing thing that you're fishing for has its own mini game mm-hmm. but that are separate from each other so it's not like a stardew valley fishing thing where you're always doing the same thing for however many hours you you do it's it's similar, but they change it up just to... yeah. yeah, there's some different ones. Like um uh, it's it's some nice variety for sure. Um and I'm, the music is just really good atmospheric stuff that we talked about yeah. on our mode podcast. And it's on my honorable mentions list, um, just because there's so many amazing games this year. But yeah, Wonderful. it's it's super, super fun. Um I had a great time. Like I, I did I was kind of like uh one hundred percenting the like fish media or whatever. I did everything good in that game. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to my number eight, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Um, one of the most creative and fun Mario games in years, with a really incredibly uh challenging and well made like final level, as most Mario games have had. Um, like post game level, like if you get everything, you unlock this insane challenge level. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite ones out of all of them. Uh, and I I went into it with like sixty lives. I ended up beating it on my very last life before I was going to have to restart the oh, entire wow. level and go grind for lives. It was, uh, it was very stressful, but, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but also like, uh, just like the wonder fruit challenges in every level are all creative and different. Mm-hmm. Like there's some that'll put you like 
danger character to being on the background and you're like playing it like an isometric game for a while until you get the wonder fruits uh there's ones that make like a your mario or whoever you're playing as super tall and you have to like duck to shrink back down and get underneath uh obstacles and stuff um just super, super, super creative challenges. And they finally made co-op a lot better than it has been in every other Mario game where you're constantly accidentally killing each other. They're, your characters do not run into each other. Um, that doesn't mean you can't jump off of each other's heads. But if you're playing as like a Yoshi, Yoshis and Nabbits are invulnerable, first of all. So that's great for newer players who uh, mm -hmm. aren't very good at the game. Um, but also you can jump on a Yoshi's back and first of all, the Yoshi can just carry you through the whole level. So if an experienced player is playing as Yoshi and an experienced player can just jump on their back and go through the whole game like that. But also you can still use that to like get extra like jump advantage and stuff if you want to like cheese getting all the collectibles. And stuff. So it still has all the advantages of the co-op in the old Mario games without all those frustrations. I feel like they finally figured that out. Outside of if someone is playing as Yoshi, sometimes you'll jump on their back and they'll jump into a hole and screw you because you accidentally jumped on their back. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely happened more than once, but... Yeah, um, probably my favorite 2D Mario game in a long time. Really, really enjoyed it. I have not played it yet. I bought it, uh, and I just got through, like, the first world or two, and uh, kind of immediately understood that I would really, really enjoy it, and I would really want to play it with Rachel and put it down, and we just haven't gotten back to it. And I honestly keep forgetting that I already bought it. Yeah, I'll see like a commercial for it and be like, "Oh, I should get that game for Rachel." Yeah. And, I. and then it's like, "Wait, no, that already exists on my Switch. I can go play it right now." And I just so many other things. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I played a couple levels at Travis's place, uh, but with Lenny, so they haven't been the most productive levels. Uh, it's a beautiful <laughs> game, but yeah, I haven't. My experience is not one to. Uh, <laughs> to yeah. rank it off of <laughs> yeah that's another thing to call out is the art style is a lot better than the Mario brothers games like the, it's kind of yeah. like slightly cell yeah. shaded or something yeah but yeah it's like done cool. a lot more with the animation and stuff on it so it pops a lot more yeah go to your number seven Preston. i'm sorry ryan uh it is remnant two remnant oh. two is my number seven. Oh, okay <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's not that bad, bro. <laughs> it's like, oh, my number. <laughs> wait to hear what is on my list. <laughs> it, it, Remnant 2 was a ton of fun. We, The three of us played, um, Chris, Ryan, and I played Remnant 1 um, all the way through last year, I guess. And that was my first time playing that game and really enjoyed it. Maybe it was early 2023. When did we play that? But... Uh, Y'all had already been so high level that we kind of just like ran through it. It was a pretty yeah. breeze. It was a pretty big breeze, especially for me who uh, was leveling at the time. So this time experiencing it kind of from the start and experiencing the the power uh, power increase curve, whatever you want to call it, power scaling. Ramp. Power ramp, yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> feeling like that, really knowing like, Oh, okay. By the end of this world, I am devastating all of these uh, characters. Whereas, whenever you're first entering a world, you're going to get killed. You're going to have a little bit more trouble. You're going to be a little bit more cautious. But by the end of each world, you just feel so much more powerful and so much more capable. Uh, and the story was good. It was better uh, than the first one, but it was still a remnant story that just kind yeah. of. It's, you're getting so many disparate pieces that are having to be connected by this meta narrative that just can't quite know what you're going to do, which is part of the gameplay, and that's fine. Um, but because of that, the meta narrative seems a little bit silly and out there. Um, but the worlds, the stories inside each world are really cool. Like the, mm -hmm. there's an elven world where you kind of can sit uh, and decide this like murder trial for a tribal or a, a, a council of elders kind of thing and it feels very authentic to that world that you're in and it feels very cool and very neat to be a part of uh and that really uh, those always felt really special yeah yeah go ahead Ryan. it's on your list uh 
yeah i mean i, I adore remnant 2 it's definitely on my list a little bit higher up um it, we it, i've played with a bunch of people this is a game i know i'm going to come back to in the coming years to just do yeah. some adventure runs throughout those worlds respawn them and play them again i i don't know that i'll ever want to fight the final boss again although i have gone back and fought the final boss now with friends who have like you know crazy builds and yeah we just beat it a couple weeks ago with like it's not terrible anymore like that first yeah. time having to fight that boss was rough but now like eh. Not, not 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 as much of a challenge i i love how much hidden stuff this game had the the class that people found through data mining and like the community like when that happened part of the community was like upset because oh can't you let people just find these things you have to data mine it blah 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 and then the devs came out and was like no like you were kind of supposed to have to data mine to find that one that's we hit it that intentionally mm -hmm. like it was that hidden in, on purpose uh, I love the world design. I think that was probably like the biggest step up from the first game is like how much more different the worlds are from each other uh, and just how well designed they are. They're, you know, much more interesting to explore than uh, the worlds from the first game. My, you know, for me, but, I, but the build variety. Ooh, mm, yeah. Oh, man. Making builds in that game feels so good. Well, that's like I played through. I ended up getting carried. Um, Y'all carried me through to the end in the last world because I was like just right there and it was going to be a quick ending. But um, I never felt like my build, you know, I got one set of armor and I kind of stuck with that for a long time. Maybe I had three armors throughout the entire game. Um, but oh my God. Who carried us through to at the end there? Uh, was that Steve? Steve, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Steve, um, his build was insane, and it was so clear that he like did his home, well, like he does with any of these games. He like mm -hmm. he really did his yeah. homework, figured out like the most optimal build, and really sought out all the different little elements. And it's like, it, it, it's a level of depth that I would never, I just dip a little toe into. I can never really take that full plunge into any game like this. Uh, but it's got that like destiny level of depth whenever it comes to your build and making sure that it's fine tuned for that in game content. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Remnant 2 didn't make my list, but I, I enjoyed it. I played it almost exclusively solo, which is probably part of why I didn't make my list. It's very much a co op focused game, much more fun in co op, mm. but no cross play, unfortunately. So. I know that's why I haven't played it yet. And then I was debate. I was gonna buy it later at some point, but then it came out on Game Pass, and because it's not crossplay, oh, yeah. which in 2022, 2023, and 2024, you should not be developing your game without crossplay. But I can't play it basically because it feels too much like it's supposed to be a co-op experience. So I have to hope somebody else hasn't played it. But everybody that's a fan of Remnant. Has already played it and bought it at this point so you're just kind of like screwed for the most part like everybody i know is xbox or i mean playstation or pc so and i want to play it on my xbox game pass so yeah yeah you guys talked about uh the build variety i really like the build variety i had because I was playing solo, I ended up making like a necromancer summoner thing where I just had a bunch of minions mm -hmm. tanking everything for me, which was super fun. Um, not super effective against some of the later bosses. I ended up having to complete change builds oh, yeah. to get to the last boss, but because um, attacks will just wipe out your minions in one hit. And then it's like, yeah, well, that was a waste, especially since it cost health to summon them. Uh, it's like, well, mm -hmm. they died and I slightly killed myself to summon them. So that went great. Um, but yeah, what, what I think. I had two like major issues with the game outside of not playing co-op. Like, um, if you are like a completionist, it is super super annoying to try and find everything in this game. It was the same in the first game where it's like the world randomized, the drops are randomized and stuff. But even more so in this game, there's like you'll get the random you, the world is randomized and you'll get the dungeon you want and it has the room you want. But then you'll like fail a platforming challenge or whatever, and they'll just lock that room off for that entire run. It's like now I have to respawn this world until I find this dungeon again so I can try this room again because I failed the one time or whatever. Frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit more tedium. There's like one of the worlds uh, has a special currency that only drops if you're in a instance of it that it has a, like a 20% chance to be a, a red moon as opposed to a regular moon. Yeah. You know, stuff cool. like that. That's, you know, like on top of the RNG of getting this part of the world to roll, now I need to get this RNG to go for me. You know, yeah, that, that's definitely a little more tedious in some areas than the first game. Yeah, I mean, the 
builds and stuff is like the main thing that kind of makes me want to play it because that was like the biggest thing for like Outriders, for instance, that I was like enjoying mm -hmm. so much. It's like I would get on one character type and I would think through all these different freaking things I could do if I got, just got that gun or I just got that armor or whatever. So and like I've watched people play through Remnant too, and I was like, I want to do that too. But and that's kind of like more of what I wanted out of Diablo 4. Diablo 4 felt a little right. too handholdy for me and just like, hey, you should do exactly this or yeah. you should do exactly this. But I like the games where it feels a little bit more open to interpretation, which whenever I've watched the handful of streamers watch play that, which I've watched quite a few hours of it, it always feels like they're they're very open to interpretation on what you're doing exactly. Yeah, it's pretty easy to like redo your character in this game too diablo 4 yeah, it's like too. it's very cheap to redo your character but you have to reassign points one at a time yeah you have like, to like go through the whole thing and they're like you thing. can't take that off because this has four points so yeah. you're like okay let me take off oh you can't take that off because you have four points here you're like okay thanks for that <laughs> yeah and then my only other like major annoyance with the game and this is fixed by the time you get into post game is like uh luminite crystals is a somewhat rare drop that you use to upgrade how many heals you have and it's also a material that's needed to upgrade the special weapons so because yep. i prioritized my healings like i just didn't use special weapons in the game at all uh even though i loved using those in the first game because it was like different materials for upgrades but yeah that that was slightly annoying because like the coolest weapons i basically couldn't use unless i was going to sacrifice getting more heals to upgrade them and make them yeah, that is something, and again, you mentioned it, but like that would have been mitigated if you're playing co-op because you wind up playing through areas multiple times and getting more Luminite crystal, you know, drops from those enemies because you're killing them again with your friends. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and then also when you're in co-op, you don't need healing as much. Like Monster Hunter, I play solo and I need like every single fucking potion I have, but then I play with other people and you need significantly less usually. Like that's how most yeah. games... I don't know if Remnant operates that way, but usually... More people uh, to take random aggro from shit means you don't need to. Focus you, you have on you have the potential to take less less damage. Yeah, and less yeah, damage yeah, basically yeah, yeah. is yeah. what I'm Like you could still yeah. take a like lot, and it's still difficult. But it's it's like even like Elden Ring and Dark Souls playing those on co op and stuff. You can usually like need to focus on your own healing and your own dodging and being perfect a bit less, so you don't really yeah. feel as much of a need to be like. I need to have the most defense and the most healing possible, where it was when you're solo, you do feel that need. Well, and that was like early game. Ryan was a healer for a while, and he would heal me up. I was playing tank, but because it is so welcome to change and welcome to altering your build, we got a little further in. We felt a little bit more comfortable. We were able to just be like, you know what? I think we're okay on heals for now. Let's move into these other builds and try out like a whole new play style effectively of co-op. Yeah. It just works so well towards that, towards mm -hmm. experimentation. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty cool. Job. Sweet. Um that was your number seven, Preston. Genetics, what's your yeah. number seven? Uh my number seven is Disney Speedstorm. It's a uh, free to play now as of like a month or two ago but it's just a really really competent racing kart game basically but it be honestly to me it feels more fun than mario kart like the only issue is again there's like a gotcha system thing going on but um once you unlock the character you can play modes where it's like all the characters are locked to the same level and stuff so it doesn't matter as much like i have a whole rant about like people are like oh in ranked it's pay to win i'm like but there's literally a whole regulated gameplay mode and you can go play in lobbies with your friends where everybody's can play as any character they've unlocked at the same exact level as each other regardless of what level they've put it at so the game is fun it's just if you focus on ranked which for some reason gamers always want to focus on ranked you feel like it's pay to win but i just mostly play solo and then i play the regulated for multiplayer and i don't care that my character's only one star or whatever because it automatically puts me at three stars level 30 with everybody else but um it has a lot of really fun drifting systems they put like classes onto the characters so like speedsters when they ram into people they uh get a speed boost and then defenders when they ram into people they get like a barrier tricksters when they ram into people they like reverse their controls for a little while and then um 
the brawlers, which is like honestly the main one that makes the ramming into people annoying. They ram into them and then they just make them like they stun them basically, which is like a little ridiculous. But and then all the classes have like different ways that they have to manage their nitro. Like trist tricksters want to be drifting all the time. Brawlers want to be stunning people all the time. Defenders want to basically be in slipstreams all the time because they're encouraged like you should be tanking and like following and stuff. And then speedsters want to be going on the speed paths all the time. And then on top of that, there's like charged versions of all the specials and there's um, uncharged versions. So like, and all the characters also have kits. Like they, it's not just like Mario Kart where like everybody has access to lightning, bomb, um, you know, all that stuff. Like you have five specific skills on each character. So like one character might have access to the fire that they can charge, use behind them or just use normal or whatever. But one other character won't have access to the fire. They'll have access to some other skill instead. So it's like they're lending themselves to actually releasing new characters and them actually having like differences rather than just like, oh, yay, you know, Lilo and Stitch is here, but it plays exactly the same as this other character. Mm -hmm. And then they all have like their own unique skills too, which is like usually the unique skills is the main point where the tier lists come into play where it's like, oh, this character is better than that character. And they've found out eventually, like basically every character's unique skill needs to give speed of some sort while they're doing it. So like some of it's a little homogenized because it's a racing game. Like what all can you do that will like truly let the character work while also making their skill unique. So they all do unique stuff, stuff but like it all lends itself into they have a speed boost now while also like throwing something behind them or doing whatever else. It feels really fun. And like the music and everything is built really well to actually honor the Disney property rather than it feeling like a cash grab to me. Like I haven't spent any money on it besides like battle passes. I did buy the deluxe edition to get the very early access or whatever, but um, which gave me the three battle passes for that season for free. But like, I hardly had to spend money. It's like, similar to like Fortnite and stuff for the most part where it's like you feel very inclined to buy the battle pass but then you don't have to touch like literally anything else but mm -hmm. just like all the mechanics and everything tie in in a way where it's it's a really fun game for the most part cool i don't think anybody here has played any game on your entire list i'm calling it now i'm, kidding. I'm sure you have other there's, games there's a few the there's there's a few people have played yeah but these ones almost definitely not those first four, I was like pretty sure no one had probably played. Uh, all right, Ryan, you're seven. my number seven is a game uh, I will cease to shut up about. I will never stop shutting up about this game. I will talk about it till the day I die. Wait, what? Did you just say Cassette you will never... Beast. I'll never stop. <laughs> so never gonna stop. Cassette Beast is so good. I'm really tired, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's cassette beast. It, this game is so freaking good. Uh, the the battling system is so good. The characters are so freaking good. The art I absolutely adore. The music is so freaking good. Uh, in a in a year that isn't twenty twenty three, this is a top three game of the year for me. Um, okay. This is this is the year twenty twenty three. We had way too many amazing games last year. Um, it, it's phenomenal. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite creature collectors that doesn't have Pokemon in the title ever made. Honestly. Um, I, I love the things they've done to, uh, you know, separate itself from Pokemon, um, and, you know, make it its own piece in the genre. Uh, it's a lot of fun, a lot of solid quality of life stuff, like the ability to take moves off and put back on creatures, uh, and swap yeah. them between creatures. Um, just, just really good stuff. It's just a really good game. Nice. Sweet. Yeah, no allegations uh, my... there of theft. <laughs> yeah, no allegations. No, no, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. no. Um, yeah, I, I it's on it's on my short list, but it's a it's a longer game, right? Like it's like 30, 40 hours or something. Uh, it depends on cause there's a lot of side content. I think I think a main romp is probably like maybe 25 hours. Main plus some wow. side is probably 30, 35. And if you're trying to do like, yeah, all the side stuff, you're probably like about 40. That's I about guess. Pokemon level, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. kind of. Sword and Shield. Pokemon's usually like 16 to 24 just to run through it. Oh, wow. And even then you could probably short, even make that shorter. Just kind of depends on what you're doing. But like the newer games, I 
are legitimately way shorter than like emerald and ruby were for me yeah like i, I, just, I feel like I, all, all the newer games still take me take me longer honestly i, th- I think the last one was I'm like 40 hours, hours or something 30. i don't know i'm always done with them within like 20 to 24 hours typically like max yeah uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not that because that beast seems long for uh, like a Pokemon like or whatever. It's just trying to fit it into the schedule is really hard because I mean, like I, yeah. I, I think I said on the Modi, like I, I played a demo of it in 2022 and really adored, especially the music. Um, I just didn't make time for it in 2020. Um, all right. My number seven, uh, we're talking about it way earlier than I know a lot of people want to uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Um. It's a an amazing oh, game. Uh, <laughs> uh, like the the head shaking. There's so much head shaking. It's I a great game. Not, I was about to do it. <laughs> off his camera. I was about to make a joke that he turns off his camera because that's what it was looking like. Uh, no, it's uh, it's obviously it's everybody knows what Baldur's Gate three is. It's built off of a uh, D and D. It's from uh, Larian Studios, who made Divinity Original Sin, Divinity Original Sin two, based off of kind of that engine, but using D and D rules and uh, like classes and stuff. The story's pretty well written for the most part. Um, I, I think the main the main thing for me why it's not like higher is that it doesn't stick the landing on a lot of the character stories for me. Like yeah. I didn't I didn't feel like 100%. a lot of the characters got the ending, but not even like the ending they deserve. They just didn't get like an interesting ending or they got a very abrupt, like weird ending. Uh, Gale and Gale specifically, like I don't really understand what happened with this ending is very yeah. odd for us. Um, uh, and maybe there's other endings we could have seen from him that would have made more sense. I don't know. Um, and then Asterion's entire story felt like it happened in act three very quickly. and should have been really good, but they didn't see that like at all. At least we missed all the seating. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Which is particular to the way that we were playing, I think. Yes, we uh, we all played as named characters in the game, which um, I think just playing four player co-op in this game in general kind of robs you of yes. getting to see these these characters because I I hear them talked about as like some of the best characters of the year, and it's like I guess I talk to them in camp every once in a while, and I guess I was technically right. Gale, but he didn't really have his personality because I was playing him, you know. Mm. Um, like Carlac seems super cool, but we had literally no interaction until the very end of the game. And it was like a, a completely unrewarding ending because everyone was just like, yeah, okay, we talked to you like five times at camp at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think maybe like two to three player co-op is kind of like the sweet spot for this game. So you can rotate in those so. other party members and playing as uh, your own characters, not as the named characters. So they can rotate in all these other party members and get their stories and see their personalities and stuff. Because there's a lot of stuff like even if you swap them in to do their stories like if you're playing two or three player having a character with you through the entire game there's a lot of just like road dialogue that you get from them that establishes their character more and stuff that mm-hmm. i know we miss a lot of you know um so yeah those are kind of my problems with the game but i mean the game's incredibly fun like we played it along with uh my girlfriend leslie for like 100 hours it was mm-hmm. it was super fun to set aside time every saturday for like God, it was like three months or something that we were playing on. Yeah, two and a half months, something like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's it's a very um, long game, but it like we were always having fun. We had like eight hour sessions like every week. It was, it and it was sometimes easy multiple days in those sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Like you we'd be like, all right, well, we can jump on for four hours today. And it would extend and it would feel like those four hours, those eight hours just disappeared. Kind yeah. of we were yeah. Um, yeah. I I wonder too if it's same thing like with Diablo earlier. I wonder if we played it now in the same way, if you would feel different because of, um, I don't know if you've seen all the things that they added to the end game, especially uh, like epilogue yeah. stuff for the story. Um, so you get a little bit more rewarding endings depending on if you what you choose. Um, yeah, I've been and seeing also, they do stuff like that. One of the biggest issues we had was like, um, Leslie played as Asterion, and like you were saying, we didn't get to see a lot of his story early on. And so if she didn't play with us, we were wanting to swap out Asterion, check out other characters. But at the time, they didn't allow that. You were just, you had to play with whatever character uh, other player characters were introduced. Yeah, they actually fixed that, didn't they? Right. 
Yeah, so yeah. they've now made it to where you can swap out. And so I wonder just well, like... Yeah, I heard initially early on people were like complaining that like they had their solo world and then they invited friends into play for yeah. a playthrough and then they were stuck with those party members like stuck in their group or something like that. Like it was yeah. a very wonky system early on. Like if I, yeah, if I was playing with three NPCs and then Ryan joined with a custom character, I always had to have that custom character and you lose a character slot. Yeah. Um, which was a terrible system, but they, they like, they fixed it. yeah, their response. And again, we, I mean, that's why they won the like, community award or whatever right. at the game awards. And that's why I kept incredible. saying it to everybody. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, everybody was like, asking me, what do you mean? They're going to win the community award. I was like, well, first of all, this game has been in early access for quite a while. And most of their advancements on the game have been from, just directly listening to the community yeah. so much. So to the point there was a few people that were like, Oh, this dual class mod that we made that we all want to play is not working. And like, they had got devs specifically into the game to make it where the dual class mod would start working for everybody. Like they, they're just actually listening to the community and what they talk about. So as soon as they started talking about the, Oh, my friend's getting trapped and their characters getting trapped in here really sucks. They like, jumped on fixing it almost like immediately because yeah. they care it really is astounding the level of responsiveness that larian showed with patching and fixing and the massive updates that we saw over six months um that put i mean i guess like the size of them and they're able to be a little bit more nimble as opposed to other much larger and much more yeah uh, their budget games but they're like a, they're, they're like an indie not indie sort of situation right, basically like, right yeah like they're smaller but they're also like big and focused so it like, feels the like they're not indie the but they should be yeah just weird a weird um, thing also importantly they let things stay broke if people want it to stay broke <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like the stupid interactions and shit you can manage in the game if people really like it they'll keep it and then like even stupid crap like oh you should let me t toss this guy's dead head and the dog will go catch it larian was like you know what that's a good idea and then like in the next patch all of a sudden you could toss the dead guy's head and the dog will go catch it and you could play fetch with the dead guy's head it's like stupid crap like that where it's like well these devs are actually listening and they actually understand what the community aspect of these games should look like. Yeah. Ultimately, Chris, I could see this being your number seven. I get it. I don't in any way. We just need you to know that you're wrong. It's a green. Agree with you. And I, yeah, you're wrong, but I get it. It's probably yeah. like the main game from last year. I want to get like really soon and actually play it, but just there's too much shit all the time. I, yeah. I, I will also say like, um, for our group, we have, you know, D&D &D veterans, and I know a little bit about D&D. &D. If you've never played D&D &D and you try and jump into this game, I've heard from Ooh. so many people, it is overwhelming and, like, incredibly hard yeah. to understand. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, to be fair to Baldur's Gate, that is a D&D &D problem. I yeah. think it's just tough to jump into D&D &D if you don't have a, a Sherpa of, of some kind. Uh, my, my only argument is, of, of all the games that came out last year for us to be talking about during a Goaty recording... One of my friends on Steam popped online to play Baldur's Gate 3 while we were talking about Baldur's Gate 3. I, I can't name a lot of other games that came out last year that have a high percentage chance of that happening. Right. Uh, you know, just hanging on that long that people are still going to be coming back and playing that regularly. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3 is, uh, you know, it's it's a, that is the game, of all the games that are phenomenal that came out last year, that is the game that uh, did not just make a splash in the industry i think it's uh, specifically for it, its genre that's a tsunami level mm -hmm. game um but for the industry overall that is a huge thing to drop uh to for it, we're going to be feeling the influences of baldur's gate for quite a long time to come hopefully yeah. <laughs> oh yeah hopefully the amount, yeah <laughs> the amount of devs that were like we should not hold this as the standard it's like no we should hold this as the standard y'all need to stop being stupid <laughs> It's like yeah. similar to the Pal World Pokemon situation right now, where it's like, yes, they might have stole some stuff. However, we should be looking at Pal World as a light that Pokemon games are kind of shit right now. Like, 
they have good concepts, they have good ideas, but they are not allowing it the proper time to actually get through development, which is what Baldur's Gate is kind of, and indie games in general have been kind of showcasing with a lot of these AAA games, is that Mm -hmm. when you put it in early access and you focus on the community and you actually focus on building the game, it can actually get somewhere, whereas these AAA games just want to release it, get the quick buck, and then they just don't care anymore, which is what the lesson that should be taken from the Baldur's Gate 3 overall. Not necessarily that you need to have a big budget and all this time or whatever, because, yeah, indie games maybe shouldn't be held to that standard, but the AAA games probably should. (laughs) That's the whole thing. And yet developers were so like, we shouldn't hold this as the standard. And you're like, no. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're the developer of like, um, I don't know, like a Sony, you know, third person over the shoulder, like, uh, you know, campaign game, like I can see saying like, we shouldn't be held to that standard or whatever because that's just not the kind of game we're making but yeah if you're like making the next dragon age and you're tweeting like we should not be held to that standard it's like you're you're making a very similar game and you probably should try to be hitting that bar that's a bar that people are going to compare you to when your game comes out um, yeah it, honestly this is like it really hurt my reception of starfield it just yeah. demolished my reception of starfield because i had just come off and also i mean it was the same thing with uh rogue trader when rogue trader came out very good game it's something that i'm sure i would love but at the same time and it's the same thing for starfield we had just come off of a 90 hour game i just did not want to give myself over to an rpg again mm-hmm. yeah so yeah the other thing is uh, that i'll call out um it's one of the few games that i really enjoyed every moment of despite the fact that you level up very rarely like you do not level up a lot in mm, D, yeah. you do not level up a lot in Baldur's Gate um I like a lot of games with that constantly give you that Absolutely. dopamine like I level up I get a skill point I get to cu- customize my build but this game it's like every five hours or something if that um but it's still like it's a very it's very impactful when you level up and the stuff you're doing in between it's not like you're grinding forever whatever you know you'll get into like these really intricate design battles that will take like an hour and you'll do a lot of story content it's not like you're just you know mashing the a button to get your next level or whatever yeah. so. uh that's my number seven go to your number six Preston. lies of p hey. lies of p and it's all because it would be much higher on my list if it weren't for that final boss um I don't uh, boss is uh, the best boss in the game. It is the most get good boss I have had to fight in so long in a game where every boss up until that point, you did not have to get good. It is the like they put the difficulty ramp, way the difficulty yeah. spike at the very end of the game. And that difficulty spike is a fucking mountain. Uh, I love and it. it was fun. I, I, I will say whenever I finally beat that final box i felt amazing like ready to just spike my controller i was <laughs> screaming the whole time I, I got really really hyped when i finally um and one of the things that they do is they give you the option of taking the out and basically ending the game without having to fight the final boss and so you're just looking at that option after like try 50 you're just hovering <laughs> over it and like, i can but see at that the point the right sunken now. cost fallacy kicks yeah, in exactly. and you're like i can't um, stop because i've already put like 10 hours into you, trying to beat this. you will forever when you talk about lies of p you will automatically caveat with like hey i didn't beat the final final boss but right right, right. it was you would have that cloud of shame hanging over you um right. like my friend mason who texted me and said he never beat the final boss so yeah Damn um <laughs> <laughs> yeah speaking it, of though in general it's okay to not complete games yeah <laughs> yes absolutely. 100% yeah. And especially at a uh, difficulty spike like that, like it is a this is a completely understandable out that people would take. Yeah. Um, so, but I think the reason why I was so drawn to it is you do get in. I love Dark Souls games already, um, but this being a Dark Souls like that is very well, like Bloodborne. It's a Bloodborne like. Um, yeah, that's the main yeah. reason people are like loving it so much is because. Bloodborne is very underserviced and even games that try to copy from software don't really try and copy Bloodborne. And this is like the first one to try and copy Bloodborne specifically. And not only did they like copy and iterate on it well, they just like 
nailed it completely. Yeah, this is the best feeling from software game that's not a from software game. Yeah, I was surprised how many people kind of commented on the idea that it didn't iterate on it enough because I thought that there were things that in, it introduced that are huge quality of life improvements for the genre as a whole, like the I, yeah. idea of being able to regain your last, yes. um, I'm just going to call it Nestus flask. Uh, <laughs> but you, even though that's not either of these, uh, but you get your last like health potion back. If, as you defeat enemies or parry them, it'll kind of recharge that up and you can just keep going for so much longer. And it feels like a little bit more of a trepidate, trepidatious re risk reward program uh, uh, system ratio, I guess. Yeah, system. But the the thing that I always don't like about Bloodborne is I get tired of moving through the worlds. I get very anxious as I'm going around every single corner, and because all the low level mobs can still really mess you up pretty good. Uh, yeah, and this was not like that at all. If you were going between between bosses, uh, and I know I think this is a critique that you have, Chris, for it, but between bosses, it's kind of, it's pretty easy. It's straightforward. It's not too hard. You may hit some mini bosses that'll give you a tough time, but I loved that about it. Like, it was just such this long breather where you got to explore the world a little bit more and feel a little bit more into the atmosphere, and then you would hit the boss fight and you would get your difficulty spikes. And that's where you can have your experience. Yeah, I, I feel like, I mean, the game in general, outside of the last, like that very, very last boss, and then there's a boss like a couple before that that I, I had some trouble with as well. I feel like the game is just generally pretty easy for Souls Likes, one of the easier Souls Likes. And then they've had a bunch of patches that have made it easier, which is uh, oh, crazy because really? it, it was, I felt like it was already not that bad when I played it. Um, but that's, I mean, that's not like a dig against it. Like, if, if you want a slightly easier Souls Like experience, you should mm -hmm. definitely check it out. Um, but yeah, I like it a little more challenging. I kind of, I kind of wish it maybe had difficulty levels or something so I could try to raise it a little bit, but, um, exploring the world is like really fun. Like it's a really interesting world and it delves in some interesting questions of like, um, you know, what is humanity? Um, and it has a story that makes sense without looking at item descriptions, which yeah. is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. With the difficulty, I hear it both ways all the time. I've legitimately seen a lot of reviewers say they feel it's harder than Bloodborne, and I've seen a lot of people say that they feel like it's easier than Bloodborne. So uh, I think it's purely just a a user thing, like it's not skill issue per se, because if it's easier, it's not skill issue, obviously, but it's like just how do you play games, which is typically the goal of most Souls likes is like, Whenever you watch one person play, they will have the hardest fucking time on one boss. And then you watch somebody else play that boss for the first time and they beat it like one try, no problem. But then they'll have a problem on a boss later that somebody else had a very easy time on. I just feel like it's a very, that's all the souls like games combined together are supposed to have that kind of feel as a genre, it feels like. Well, it's very build dependent. Very yeah. build dependent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, the the only other thing I really want to say about Liza P is uh the, there's like a there's a post game like teaser for their next game that I think is amazing. Oh yeah, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. That really was one of the best like post game things that I've seen in a long time. That it made me like, oh yeah, I cannot wait for this next one. Yeah. Uh, great game. Great game. Uh, genetics. Uh, my number six is actually just funnily enough. I didn't even realize it ended up here, but Street Fighter Six, <laughs> hey. uh, which uh, I did make an argument with myself for it to be much higher. It's like one of the main fighting games I've actually sunk a lot of time into recently. That isn't like Ash Brothers or some stupid crap, <laughs> but um, I just really enjoyed the game. The character creator is really cool, and the world tour actually like gives a single player mode for a fighting game that like had girth and actual like weight to it and lets you interact with the characters and builds up these cool ass characters that haven't gotten like a whole lot besides just reading lore and stuff every now and then. And because of the fact that it's just your own main character interacting with all the characters, it feels like you can make character moments with every character. So they're all getting to breathe a little bit more rather than just like 
the standard fighting game narrative narrative where it's like oh you're following ryu this whole time and maybe he has one interaction with chun li and then there's one interaction with guile it's like the world and the cool ass characters actually get to breathe more but then just like being able to combine their fighting styles in stupid ways on your stupid main character and you can make them look as cool as you want or as stupid as you want is really fun and then like in the online lobby they have like these legacy cabinets to like all these old ass capcom games and stuff so like as a whole the game just feels like they understood the assignment of like they're still trying to continue the capcom like resurgence that's been going on recently i feel like it's only been like resident evil 3 that's been like a complete dud for the most part and even then that was still like whatever it's just because they outsourced it to someone else but um i don't know it's just really fun it's very accessible for if you don't play fighting games a lot like i've been able to do pretty well on it for the most part and i don't play fighting games very much i just watch a lot of fighting games and it's pretty much one of the best looking fighting games besides like grand blue fantasy versus and like well, that's Arc System Works. All of Arc Systems Works stuff yeah. looks better than this because they're anime flashy bullshit. But it's pretty much... And Tekken 8 maybe looks better than this. But besides those, it's like, it's the best it's ever looked. It actually redeems the fact that Street Fighter V was kind of like crap on release and took forever to get to a good point. Uh, it's just a really good game and they... They did uh, the live service thing is working out OK enough, except they're overcharging for some of the costumes like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff was like fifteen dollars for one of the turtles. And then like the mask, just the mask for your custom character was like five dollars. It's like hmm. that's that's a little egregious. I don't know why you're doing that, but OK, I just won't buy them then. But yeah, it's been pretty good for the most part. Yeah, I played the demo and uh, it was a it was a good time. I'm I'm not a big fighting game guy. I played a lot of Mortal Kombat one year. That's on my honorable mentions and make my top ten. But um, yeah, yeah, it's Street Fighter, not like my cup of tea. But I like that they've added like some RPG elements and stuff to the story mode, the world tour and stuff. Yeah, I like, I like, like that. Uh, in general, the story modes for fighting games are being pushed forward in a, I don't mm-hmm. know, a more interesting yeah. direction. Yeah, it seems right. like they all kind of came together and did something similar. Uh, like Tekken 8 has a very similar that world happened, or yeah, the, the arcade, the arcade thing. thing, which is basically like the tutorial as well for the game. If you go in there, it actually right, helps you right. learn the game proper or whatever. So, it's yeah, I think they all just kind of well, they all probably are definitely, especially in Japan, most game devs are very like talking to each other and tighten it. Yeah. Like, you'll see Sakurai talking to Haru, Harada or however you pronounce his name all the freaking time on their podcasts and stuff. like they're all very talkative with each other. So they all probably recognize these things that around the same time and then actually work on adjusting the genre as they need to, like to actually get somewhere. Wait, which I feel like mortal Kombat helped with 11, a little bit, the crypt and everything and exploring the mm-hmm. crypt and all that, even though that was a grindy ass mess, it still like showed like, Hey, there's some things you can do with your fighting game that you guys aren't currently doing. And then sure. of course Street Fighter 6 and Tekken are now doing that. And then Smash has also shown maybe you should try a little bit harder as far as like the casual side of things and everything goes. So overall the genre is starting to get somewhere and we have all the tryhards tryharding a bit less. <laughs> so <laughs> casuals can actually get into it a little bit more. The only thing that's still left to go away is like the people that hate on Wi-Fi players because that's like the most annoying shit. It's like most of the time they will fight plenty of Wi-Fi people that are just like, it works just fine. But then they get the one that has like extreme packet loss and shit. They're like, oh, it's just the Wi-Fi players again. It's like, it's just annoying. But they all have rollback now. They all have easier inputs. They're all advancing. And Street Fighter Six is like the culmination for me. So it just works. Wait, Ryan, what's your? My number six is Remnant Two. Mm. Nice. Mm. My number six, High Five Preston, Liza P. Let's go. Mm. Wow. My number five. For skipping right through this, this will get us going pretty quick. Legend of Zelda, Tatuk, Tears of the Kingdom, Tatuk, Tatuk. It. 
was really, really good. I did not come close to beating that game uh, even after probably 40 to 50 hours. But uh, I absolutely loved it. It was, it, I mean, it absolutely made Breath of the Wild look like a tech demo for a much better game. And it is astounding that this thing runs on the Switch. It blows my mind. And it, again, you may have some like pretty big frame rate dips, uh, but all of that is just, com- it's forgiven. You just, you accept it because of course you're going to have frame rate dips in this game. Yeah, the it's one of the like most massive open worlds I've seen, and it is like seamless mm-hmm. going from one place to another. Uh, it's it's ridiculous that it runs on the Switch. It is it is mind boggling. Um, yeah, the going into a tower, shooting yourself into the air, and then gliding either to an island or however far across the map that that works as well as it does is is incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was I was shocked how much I liked this game because I Breath of the Wild was very much like it's fine, but it was not like my cup of tea. It didn't do it for me. I was really wanting them. Like Genetics still wants them. I wanted them to like go back to old Zelda style because it just wasn't for me. But they fixed so many things that I didn't like about Breath of the Wild. Um, right. From you know breakable weapons don't matter anymore because you can build custom great buildable like breakable weapons all the time. So like your weapon breaks, I'll build a new one. Like it does not matter. Not like feel I don't feel limited ever by a weapon mm-hmm. breaking. Um, because there's materials everywhere to build things with. Uh the puzzle mechanics are just so much better being able to literally build like near infinite solutions, it feels like, to any problem. Unbelievable, incredible. Ultra hand's such a freaking mind-boggling mechanic, but that works on the switch yep. is also ridiculous. <laughs> being able to just like build bridges and build machines and mechs and stuff in this game to solve your problems or just for fun. Um, like people have created some crazy, crazy stuff in the game. Like I didn't, I never created anything remotely close to like a mech or anything, yeah. but I still had a lot of fun just building, building bridges and like uh, finding creative solutions with a uh, like ascend and rewind and stuff to get up to high places. Mm-hmm. Like uh, that's the- another thing I think ascend doesn't get enough uh, love as compared to Master Hand because, uh, or not Master Hand. What is it called? Uh, ultra ultra hand. hand ultra hand um yeah the ascend like just being able to shoot your way straight up through a mountain and just get out of a cave instantly like we were talking about with sea of stars if you're at the bottom of a dungeon you have to run back all the way through and it seems silly yeah tears of the kingdom a 3d open world game that will take you back to the very beginning of a dungeon effectively or outside of it uh as quickly as it does as yeah. amazing yeah yeah um, i mean it definitely fixes a lot of the issues i have with breath of the wild it's just still like i personally i like when there's a few solutions to something but having like so many solutions and being able to be just break the puzzles it's like some of the shrines legitimately feel just like oh i did this and now i'm done and it's like you find out that that's not even the way you're supposed to do it that's actually probably like the 50th way you're supposed to do it but it just completely invalidated the puzzle. I don't like that per se. I like a few solutions, not like infinite solutions. But then more so than that, it's like it is a miracle. It runs on the Switch, but at the end of the day, it's still on the Switch. If this game was on the Xbox Series X or the PS5, you would be able to build even crazier shit. It would be running at 60 frames and it would not chug on frames. You know, like there's people running it on the PC emulator. And it actually like has more of an appeal for me because it doesn't look like janky what criminals. What? I know. Um, that, I mean, ran, I'm pretty sure they actually bought Switch, it. But... This ran great on my Switch when I played it earlier this year. <laughs> I know. I'm talking about other people no. I've watched play it on their emulators. I I did actually buy the game. And they most of them that I've seen have bought the game too. Oh, you actually played it on the emulator? Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Gotcha. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's incriminating himself already. So I did actually buy the game because my girlfriend really wanted to try it. And I did play through to like the first dungeon. I completed the first dungeon or whatever. And then I just like I fell off. I just I can't be bothered with this game that's like hey spend 100 hours doing the same exact thing basically like it feels locked down into 
I just don't like, there's no progression feeling to me. It's just like, hey, go take these things and build the same things over and over again. I'm like, I'd rather go into an actual survival game and build random shit or something rather than do this. I don't know. It just like, I get why everybody likes it, but to me, it just like, it does not click on that level because I can only build a freaking bridge so many times before it's like, okay, I'm kind of over it by now. I can only build the same so exact you have car to work so many a little times. Bit further into the story to get another I've power. seen I've seen <laughs> I've seen what can happen and other stuff that does occur it's just like and then like while it, whenever I did have a moment where it's like okay I'm gonna go crazy I started building like this really cool car or whatever and they're like oh you hit the glue limit it broke my first glue and then the whole thing like came apart and I was just like I'm fucking done like this is just stupid Nintendo please like actually advance your fucking hardware it's just stupid at this point I just don't like um, it. Like I get the system's cool. I would just wish that it would let me do more with it. Yeah, for me, I never felt like a shrine was like invalidated by the number of solutions that I had to it. Or if I came up with a creative, like really stupid solution that solved in an instant, I was like, that's fucking hilarious. And I love that mm-hmm. that just happened. Like I was never disappointed that I didn't do the actual solution or whatever. Like uh yeah, and, like and it Nintendo does. does the... And Nintendo does have like watch people play and do this stupid shit, and they're like, "That's cool." They like that there's dumb new mm-hmm. solutions that they didn't think of to problems because they created a really, really interesting set of tools to solve problems with that they can't predict everything that's going to happen with them. And I love that. Yeah, and it does make sense. Like it is cool as a whole. It's just like I like the original Zelda experiences, like Majora's Mask, Ocarina, like even like some of the more recent old ones like skyward sword and stuff are still just like it's a more cohesive experience to me it's also a shorter experience because it's not just like here's four things go do whatever we don't care like it just it feels more cohesive to me and it feels like a better package to me personally i just don't like where zelda's going and it's probably gonna stay there which means it's probably going to become a franchise i just don't care about yeah i mean i think that's why i adore this game as much as i do is because i was in that spot with breath of the wild where i was like i don't really like result is going even though it's been one of my favorite series for a really long time and tears of the kingdom completely turned me around um like if they continue the direction of having more interesting tools and also like it, it you know i played like 110 hours of this game or something i was never bored i always felt like i was finding new things the only thing that got old and i didn't like finish exploring was the depths eventually it was like it's a lot of empty space um that you're just yeah. like mm-hmm. shooting torches to try and find the next like flower thing to light up more area but the yeah. entire overworld and the sky it's like constantly more puzzles new puzzles um a bunch of bosses and mini bosses everywhere um that are always giving me things that feel rewarding so yeah it's like i felt that for the first part of the game and then at some point like through numerous times i just was like okay i'm kind of done exploring now and then i tried to do the building thing i was like okay i'm kind of done with that because they broke it in some way it's like there's just a lot of little hitches where it's like i see what this game's going for but it does not it's like similar to like breath of the wild how uh immortals rising phoenix came out and it felt like breath of the wild but it fixed everything that i hated about breath of the wild and i actually liked phoenix i feel like that somebody could take tears of the kingdoms mechanics and shit and actually do it better for me in a way where it actually clicks a bit more because like it still felt similar to breath of the wild where it's like yes they had accomplished more variety and stuff since developed exclusively for the switch but I still felt like it was very samey the whole way through, which is probably just a general open world problem a lot of the time. Like I I played it for, I think, a solid 40 hours or so. And I tr- did exploring and shit for so long. It just like eventually hits a point where I'm just like, I'm kind of done. I just can't anymore. Yeah, I think I, I, I enjoyed Myrtle's Phoenix Rising because it has like some cool puzzle mechanics and stuff. But I think in terms of the open world, I think they they like... Ubisoft it in a really shitty way to me where it's just like yeah you should you can technically go anywhere and do anything but if you look in your little like zoom scope thing and look around we'll just ping everything that's interesting and put it on your map and you go there and it's just following points on the map again like every other open world game ever what I really like about Tears of the Kingdom is like the game's not telling you everything that's interesting there's like a basic design Mm -hmm. on the map but it's like that looks interesting so i'm gonna go there and see what's up and there's always something that's up like there's always something to see but it's not like the game's like here's here's where shrine is and here's where a boss is and yada yada blah 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 Um, so let me let me counteract for a second why is that a problem for diablo 4 but it's not a problem for 
Tears of the Kingdom. Because Diablo 4 has one thing that it is not being on your map that is essential to get if you want your character to be optimized. And that's like, that's it. It's, it's not like you're going there and it's like, there's something interesting to do here. There's a thing you click on and it gives your character static. That yeah, makes that's... sense. But it's, I don't know. I just, I don't like the system as a whole personally. Sure. Um, but I, I, I mean, I adore this game and I'm glad Zelda's heading in this direction now. Like this revitalized my love mm -hmm. of Zelda after Breath of the Wild really, really wrecked it. Um, but also this game, second best Zelda story, I think, like, the, the moments mm -hmm. here are incredible. Skyward Sword, I think, has a slightly better story because there's just story, I guess. But, like, um, yeah, the, the story, it, the story the elements that you find overall. here, like, and the fact that you can, like, find them in, like, different orders, like, you can really yes. come across the moments the at any point. Sure yeah, it's it works so well. Like, uh, yeah, definitely, like, if, even if you're not going to play this game, just, like, check out the story, like, the memories um, and on YouTube or something because... It's really, really interesting. I think it's I think it's a lot cooler if you play through the game and find the memories and like discover the thing, <laughs> like the big spoiler that we're not gonna talk about here uh for yourself. But uh yeah. It definitely I, I mean it's lower down on my list. It's number five just because of how overwhelming this world is. Um and eventually I just had to put it down. But it's something that I know I'll be. I will there are so many games much shorter than this one that I never go back to. And I know that I'll continue to go back to this one and jump back into this world. But that's yeah, my number five. Ryan, I know you also played a lot of Tears of the Kingdom. I don't know if it's on your list, but did you want to talk about it at all? Uh, it's on my list. I, you know, Chris, you and I were in a very similar position. Breath of the Wild, not, you know, I mean, that's fine. Um, Tears of the Kingdom really fixed a lot of those issues for me. You, you know, just want to reiterate a lot of those points. So, you know, it's 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 a little higher up on my list for sure. I was shocked at how I up uh, it really wound up being. Um, it was uh, I was I, it was a really good game. It's it's very good. I, I'm I'm excited for the next Zelda in a way I wasn't excited for the next Zelda mm -hmm. after finishing Breath of the Wild. I mean, it makes sense because it did actually do a lot to fix what generally wasn't good about Breath of the Wild. Yeah, give me Wind Waker too, and not no Spirit Tracks. Nonsense. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The what, what was the one on DS before Spirit Tracks? That was literally a sequel to Wind Waker, but Phantom Hourglass. That's all right. Yeah. yeah, Phantom Hourglass. I mean, I like the mobile experience. It's just fine as far as like they're just smaller, lesser Zeldas for the most part, but they're still not the greatest thing, obviously. All right, Genetics. Let's go to your number five. My number five is Hogwarts Legacy, which uh, I spent quite a bit of time in. I actually bought it twice because my girlfriend played it on my PS5 or our PS5, whatever. At the same time, basically, we both played through um, and we just enjoyed it a lot. It's like just legitimately the only Harry Potter experience. If you want a Harry Potter experience in a video game, it actually feels like it's Harry Potter related and like not just a stupid cheap money grab or whatever because the movie's coming out or like all the collectibles feel cohesive to the world it's not it doesn't feel like when you're playing like assassin's creed and they're like chase this random page that's Other flowing area. through the world or whatever it's like which in this you are chasing some random pages <laughs> that are flying through the world How, however it's harry potter which has magical books and pages that fly through the world and stuff like that so there's like a creature catching mechanic that you get into at some point and you can like capture these creatures to like save them from becoming endangered and keep them in like a little shrine area there's a house like little decoration mode that you can like decorate a whole ass house and like like a house it's like a the room of requirements or whatever the heck it's called in the movie um you can get a all sorts of furniture and decorate it however you want you can have it make like potions and stuff for you to explore through the game and then like the the build variety is like decent enough it's like kind of the same basic thing as far as the combat goes but it feels like if devil may cry was with guns more than it is currently basically but rather than feeling like a gun the want magic actually feels like magic so just as a whole it's really fun and really good overall and yeah, not much else to say about it. Just needed Quidditch. That's pretty much the main complaint. Yeah, I, I didn't play it. Leslie has started playing it, and I watched a little bit of it. Um, it's fine. I mean, it seems like a pretty 
like typical open world games. So I'm, I guess I'm interested. Like, I mean, did you like skip a lot of the open world content and stuff? Because you don't really like open no, world I mean, games. No, I mean, but it's a very I've been doing it. Like, world. that's what I'm saying though. Is like an open world game has to have a specific feel to actually like feel like it's doing something for me. Like this, like discovering stuff and everything actually feels more eventful for me than a lot of open mm. world games. So I, it's like it's actually checking off boxes more so whenever you're collecting stuff rather than just like oh i discovered this thing what is it doing for me oh yeah. not much so it's just like I, it feels different i didn't really get that vibe when i played through the open world exploration kind of felt pretty generic for me uh yeah. but exploring hogwarts did feel very good yeah like, like that's exploring the, the school that feels exploring good, the school grounds itself felt very good they did a very good job making that feel magical and feel like hogwarts but like running around the world on my broom very much felt like, oh, I'm just flying towards a checkpoint off in the distance to go do another type of the same activity that I've done seven of to check it off on the list to get it for the achievement. Um, I, I had a really good time with this game. There, there was an iteration of my list where it was on it, but it is uh, just in the honorable mentions for me this yeah. year. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I think it, as a whole, it's just like, it's a good time. It's it's yeah. genuinely a good time in a in a year that's again in a year that's not twenty twenty three. That's on my top ten for sure. I oh think. yeah, but, for sure, right? Yeah. Like it's a. Uh, I don't know. I think I just like I find the Harry Potter formula fits the exploration and discovery a little bit better for me. I don't know. Like I've just been so. It's like. I don't know. For some reason, it just fits, especially since there's been so many shitty Harry Potter games. You're just like, please. Can we get something good? Whereas on the opposite side, it's like, like, um, with like Tears of the Kingdom and stuff, it's like, I haven't had shitty Zelda games. So then I get to a Zelda experience that isn't clicking for me. It just feels lesser is all. So it's like, and then again, talking about like Zelda and stuff like that, it's like, it's a definitely a really, really stupidly good game. It's just comparing it to all the other Zeldas. I feel lesser about it. If it was not Zelda, it would be a really good game to me. It's just like the fact that it's Zelda is what pushes it down for me. It's it's a weird conundrum that it runs into on itself. And that's similar to this. If this was not Harry Potter, it would probably feel more generic. But because it's Harry Potter and I have the legacy of all the shit games that the franchise has had, it's it feels like it's so much better than it is. Nah, like, I don't know. I, it, it barely, for me, once you're off the school grounds or uh, outside of Hogsmeade, it almost just feels like Scotland simulator. And like, it, yeah. and like outside of flying on the broom, it loses that Harry Potter touch a little bit because you're not so connected to everything that, you know, feels yeah, like I definitely the, the can Harry feel Potter that world. Too. It's like, but. Uh, definitely at that point, once I'm not in like Hogsmeade or, uh hogwarts i i started streamlining the game just a little bit more than i normally mm -hmm. would have but like yeah. when you're in hogwarts i spent Ugh. so much fucking time in hogwarts i could walk it around like that school for hours ridiculous yeah. and like you're walking yeah. around and like the students like you randomly see students getting yelled at by like the red letters and like then you mm -hmm. see students pranking each other you see like all these little random interactions between teachers and students and stuff and it actually feels mm -hmm. very like lived in and what you would expect out of seeing a scene in the movie basically yeah. so yeah. it's like hogwarts and hogs media yeah, it's like i'm in general agreement it's like the open world part probably needed something a little bit more like it's i don't fine. know what it's they could have done it's fine world. right yeah. it's just like those two, for the most part those two like, parts are that's like the biggest part that sells it yeah yeah for absolutely. sure wait um preston did you have anything to say about hogwarts no Ooh. Let's go to who are we on? Ryan, your number five. My number five, Starfield. All right. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't even might seem this, like though. a weird pick. I played through this game to like New Game Plus Plus or Plus Plus Plus. Um, wild. I it, it feels wild because I get it. I've I, you know I, I've played that much of this game. I get it. It has not changed. But I went into this knowing i wasn't even assuming i just knew i was like i'm going to be playing skyrim in space that's what's going to be happening and that's what i got it has its problem it absolutely has its problems yeah those are the main people that i see like <laughs> actively defending the game and actively enjoying it it's just like 
They're like, there's going to be Bethesda jank. It's going to have a lot of problems. It's just Skyrim in space, whatever. I still like Skyrim. I still like that yeah, classic exactly. Bethesda RPG experience. Yeah. I like looting. I like shooting. I like arguing with myself over what pieces of loot I'm dropping. Because if I pick this thing up, I'm not going to be able to sprint the whole way back to my, whatever it happens to be. Like it's That's a gameplay loop that is still very satisfying to me. I like what they've done to... In a way where, you know, how many people have the experience? Yeah, I played Skyrim for seven years and never beat it. Uh, I like how they've encouraged you to actually, like, play through the main campaign and to keep playing Starfield. I think that's a, a interesting way to get people to do yeah. something that is almost seen as, like, a, you know, uh, you know, a standard to not do in Bethesda games. Is You never beat the main story. You just go out and play the sidelines. I think the sidelines are really good. Bethesda, once again, does nail the side missions in a great way. Um uh, they, it, you know what? In in the realm of Bethesda games, this is the best feeling shooting Bethesda game we've ever oh, had. Yeah, I don't, absolutely. I don't think it stands up to the best shooters on the market, but Bethesda really did up their game. Really yeah. yeah, they did a great job. Um, I mean, you know, I want to talk about cons, right? Like, sure, you you step down on any play. Oh, look, this is this one of the same six different buildings that enemies could be inhabiting, right? Like, it's it's a little copy paste um when you're out and about in the wilds of space uh i think everyone was hoping for a little bit more ship control than we wound up getting um and obviously bethesda does not know how to make a good navigatable menu ui it's just against it's, just, <laughs> oh, it's, it's against yeah. their company code all right they just can't do it yeah. um <laughs> but once you once you figure out how to navigate their menus you don't have to fast travel three or four times. You can usually just fast travel once or every have to go as long as you've been there before. Uh, and and I mean, yes, that's not the most exciting thing. You would rather be flying it more like No Man's Sky. But it's a, in the way that, like I said, I was tempering expectations. I was going into this like Skyrim, but lasers like that's, that's all I wanted out of this game. And God damn it, Todd, you gave it to me. <laughs> I know. It's funny you bring up No Man's Sky, though, because I think that's actually the main <laughs> game that makes everybody go like, I don't like this. <laughs> like No Man's Sky released crappy and they've made so many advancements and people are really actively enjoying that now. But, but they, I feel like it dampered some people's like reality I, for Starfield. I've been I was excited for No Man's Sky before release. It's a game I've played on and off since launch. I don't think I've ever been as hooked on No Man's Sky as I was the first two or three weeks near launch of Starfield. Makes sense. Uh, like, because the the way the story, like, I don't know, something about yeah, that, I know. like that, that aspect hooks me in harder. Yeah, um, because No Man's Sky isn't like too much of a story, really. It's just more of a gameplay thing. Yeah, which I think so, it depends on what you're focusing on. If your story, you'll probably want a Bethesda No Man's Sky, but if you want gameplay a little bit more, so maybe No Man's Sky. Yeah, yeah, maybe. or if you're looking maybe. for more more a uh, more a true like space experience maybe you're gonna you know go for a little more no man's sky because i yeah like uh starfield is a little bit more almost like star trek in that ex you know in that way where it's almost more like you're going out and meeting different you know yeah, different that's cultures a really way to look at that yeah, yeah. He, it's it's less about the exploration between planets and more about what's happening within each planet's political sphere and how you're going to be influencing it while you're there yeah, 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 that is a great way to I, actually. You saying that makes me want to go back to it, like reframing my <laughs> I brain. I mean, offhand, it's like that. It's a little bit better. Yeah, um, not that I've played Starfield, but that's part of what's always interested me with the Star Ocean games. Is uh, it's it's in space, but it's very focused on how they're affecting the world. So it, that actually does, like he's saying, make me want to play Starfield a little bit more. Is like focusing on the politics and stuff which is what star ocean does yeah. it's not like oh we're in space this is so magical it's like how are we going to interact with this planet that's only at like a medieval yeah. level or how are we going to interact with this new race that we can't actually speak to or stuff like that you know and we all know bethesda knows how to set up good plot lines and yeah and, exactly and, and worlds and politics schemes you know like that's that's stuff they're they're very good at doing and it's it's great it's on display here in starfield for me i uh so yeah i mean even with all its problems uh, you know, it, it on it ekes its way up to number five for me. Nice, nice. Yeah, I know I, I cut I, off Preston, I think, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I was not. I bought the headset and the controller, and I did not beat this game. Um, I, I was so hyped for it, and I love my headset and controller. 
<laughs> got the collector's edition. He does have that on me. That does make more sense that he would beat it. Um, there were too many barriers to gameplay. And I think, uh, oh my gosh, like sitting down in the cockpit and getting up from the cockpit and then walking around, it's just there's there's slowness in games where like maybe you have like a red dead redemption 2 that's a little bit more of a simulator where you're just reaching mm-hmm. down to pick something up or to skin something mm-hmm. and then there is this like unnecessary i don't think it's loading but it's just this unnecessary amount of taking your hands off the controls in this game uh, in a way that got me very frustrated and uh i i do think that they in the end, I think that I wish that they had gone the Outer Worlds um, route and done more large hub areas with bespoke things rather than a planet with uh, dotted landmarks across the map because it's just, it does not feel good to go find them and it does not feel rewarding once you do. Uh, but that being said, story interactions, random moments when you're in space, some guy pulls up to you and asks if you want to extend your ship's warranty. Um, <laughs> little moments like that are like really Bethesda special. And it has all of that, but you have to be willing to get over all the hurdles that impede you from playing the game. And that is difficult. Yeah. I have Starfield downloaded. I'd like to make time for it at some point, but I think in general, like I, I like fallout a lot, but Bethesda RPGs, I think are like they're a big time investment and like, I'd say 75% of the content is like really good. And then some of it's like uh, generic, like copy paste and stuff. Like you talked about the buildings and stuff that are copy paste and like mm-hmm. Fallout 4. It's like they have whole storylines that are just like randomly generated missions that they don't tell you are randomly generated, but you realize after a while, like, wow, these feel really freaking generic. Um, and I think, yeah. I think just Obsidian has done it better with something like Outer Worlds. And that's why I'm really excited for Outer Worlds 2 and Avowed because I feel like they're doing what Bethesda does, but they're doing it more contained more focused. Um, and more yeah. more focused and uh, more like um more authorship i guess um mm-hmm. but that's said, i didn't actually play starfield i'm sure it's a fun game um but that will move to my number five which i don't think anybody else here probably played octopath traveler 2 uh it oh. is <laughs> I, I just want to play it <laughs> it's a it's a great game it's um I, first of all, you don't have to play Octopath Traveler one. Don't play. Don't go back and play Octopath Traveler one. I played maybe like eight hours of that game. I think I finished everybody's chapter one. Never finished it. It got really boring. The characters are not as well written. The stories are not as interesting. These characters are written really, really well. Their individual stories are amazing, and they have a lot more crossover with each other. Like there's chapters where the characters cross over with each other, and you get to see their interactions. And there's an ending that culminates in them all like coming together against like a major fort, um, which is really cool. But also like. This game has a really great class system. Um, Bravely Default 2 is another game. Not enough people play it. Had a really great class system, completely breaking the game. This one, really great class system where you can multi-class and uh, like just completely break the game with the combinations you can make, which is one of my favorite things in games. Is like, I, I, you know, I'm not going online and looking up builds. I'm like, I'm just going to experiment with these classes and see if I subclass this class on this class and I do this, does that make my character broken yes it does i love that i love just trying to like make really really broken builds for turn-based rpg characters and then dominate bosses yeah, but this game like also has people had going on yeah but this game also has a like post-game boss like even post that you know end game thing where they all come together there's like another post-game boss that is unbelievably difficult that even my broken builds like could not handle like that is maybe hmm. the one thing i did not like super enjoy in the game is like i had to go look up like what is the build I need to make to beat this thing? Cause nothing I do works and you have to make like, you have to do like very specific, like, um, like chains of attacks and stuff to, to beat that final boss. I don't like secret bosses that are like that. They're like more, it's more like a puzzle than like a challenge. You know, my characters were all maxed out and stuff. It's just, there's like, if you attack this guy in this way, he's going to retaliate and you're going to die. So you can't attack him that way. You got to find the way you're able to attack him. Um, but yeah, it's just like, uh, it's really fun to custom characters and make, broken builds and i also i had like a stupid amount of money by the end of this game and there's a class that you can spend a lot of money to do absolutely broken attacks like even if you're not multi-classing or doing anything interesting you're just not spending money throughout the game you'll you'll just be able to use that move a bunch 
and it has the 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 bravely default like breakpoint system where you can stock up turns and then take like four turns at once, which is just a, a way to make uh, turn based games interesting. Right? So yeah, Octopath Traveler two, check it out. Uh, Preston, what's your number four? Resident Evil Four remake. I also did not realize that I. <laughs> It was super good. I never played the original, so I never had to deal with uh, that awful, terrible game that I'm pretty sure is remembered as a failure in the industry, and everyone was really glad that they finally updated it because they were sick of it, and it's terrible Wii controls. It was it was a Wii game, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I was glad that they finally updated that terrible game and made this really fun, pretty game. Uh, and it was as absurd as I'm sure the original was. I had no <laughs> idea that it went the places that this game goes. And I got to experience all of that wacko weirdness for the first time. And it was super endearing. And all of the uh, Leon love, I finally, like, I get it. He is one of the best characters just for how i don't know like it's it's so it's, it's so like corny. At, on the face yeah on, on the face it takes itself so seriously and leon takes himself so seriously but it's all just some of the dumbest goofiest things and he'll have his like snide remarks uh it's and it felt good like i played on one of the easier modes i'm not a big fan of survival shooters uh but it or survival horror i should say um but playing it stepping it down you felt like you could still get it i still felt like i was challenged like a lot of people say you still end up at the end of a fight um there's a specific boss fight that i'm thinking about halfway through in a cathedral where you end up at your last bullet a lot of times you could really use up everything and it's really perfectly tuned to make sure that you're actually like feeling like you're scrounging around just to survive. But by the end of the game, you're feeling pretty powerful and you're feeling pretty good. Yeah, and I mean, Resident Evil 4 was the first game that had like um, the upgradable weapons that you would go into New Game Plus and keep the upgrades and you keep upgrading them until you made them like well and truly busted. Um, and they use that again in Resident Evil Village, which is my favorite Resident Evil game. And they obviously yeah. keep that here in Resident Evil a remake. Um, yeah, it's just it's an incredible remake. They they reworked some sections that were like really not good in the original game. Um, and they cut some stuff that like just didn't quite work. But then a lot of that stuff that they cut, they actually ended up reworking and bringing back for the separate ways DLC, like the free DLC. Oh, cool. I think it was free. I don't. Um, I don't remember. I think it was ten dollars. The Ada thing. The Ada, yeah. Which uh, you should definitely play if you haven't pressed it. It's very fun. Um, but yeah, I, I mean. It is, it is also on my list. It's just, it's a really, really good time. Yeah, it was something that was special. I'm so glad it came out when it did at the beginning of the year before many other things, and it felt uh, very approachable in its time. And you have people that are doing runs in their new game plus runs. Um, you can just sprint right through that game once yeah. you've beaten it once. It's crazy. I did not know the kind of capabilities that you get where you can just run through it. And I, it, it's a reason just like with resident evil village, they did the same thing, obviously, like you were saying to leave it installed and come back to it and play through it again. And that's not typically how I interact with games, but with these two, uh, this one in resident evil village, I was happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Ari, uh, Ari eight, uh, Ari four remake. And then also resident evil two and three, uh, I'll even install them on my hard drive because I can just go back and do a run of those and it's super fun. Yeah, I beat that game six times in like three weeks. So oh, you, shit. Can, you can start going very fast. I got the platinum in that game. There's a, a significant challenge like Resident Evil Village was. Like the hardest difficulty, grotesquely hard, but I, I like a good challenge in a survival horror game. Um, let's go to four. My number four is Spider Man 2. Uh, I don't know what else what else to say that I, people probably just had generally haven't heard. Just really good production value, really good voice acting, really good 
sucks you in. You feel like you're Spider-Man. It's very fun. Like the combat feels really good. Uh, I'm not of the same camp where it's like it feels too much like the other two games that that should be a detriment. I feel like it's a plus, honestly, especially since the games are all like 10 to 20 hours like to streamline through anyway. It's like and even to platinum, it's like maybe 40 ish hours tops. Like, I don't mind that it's the same as the other two because it's not like a 100 hour game on any of them. But, also, um, I think they they did enough they to like plenty, differentiate right? it. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. Saying. Like the wingsuit, but... the wingsuit mm-hmm. makes swinging feel different. The swinging the way they, like they improved it a little bit. The, the combat, way they tweak combat to work for yeah, both characters it, at the same exactly. time. Yeah, and yeah, like yeah. the gadgets, they took it off mm-hmm. the stupid little wheel and they made it where you can quick quick yeah. push them or whatever like that's what i've been saying this whole time but everybody is so gung-ho about like oh it doesn't feel like they did very much i'm like mary jane or her her parts got better too like i actually like marginally them just fine. yeah they're i saw not, i saw them not like her parts but it's still like i'm playing a spider-man game i'd rather be playing a spider-man, Spider-Man. right now but they actually made her like work they're better and there's than, fewer like, of them there's fewer they, they of them, them right <laughs> and like It's funny when people always make the joke that she's so OP, which like, yeah, that's the point kind of. But like the developer was even talking about that They wanted her to feel like because she is an integral character to Spider-Man's stories. So they want to make sure she like can play a role. So how do you do that in a video game where you're playing as these characters and you, since you're playing as them, are so freaking strong and everything? It's like, well, she probably has to be able to be some level of self-sufficient and strong. So it's like. Yeah, it's stupid that she's running through just killing people with one freaking stun gun or whatever, but it just like but she also dies in one hit too typically, so well, I played on yeah. the hardest difficulty, so I don't know for sure what it is on easier difficulties, but the game's just fun overall. The side content actually feels pretty good, like collecting the little bots leads to a fun little secret ending thing. The Mysterio stuff leads to some fun events, like everything yeah. on the side actually had felt like it had a little bit of purpose and it's not just like collect a thon just for the purpose of the game running a hundred hours or something. It's like collect a thon for the point of the game maybe reaching like 30 to 40 hours Mm -hmm. maybe. And it's like you're swinging from checkpoint to checkpoint and it's a small enough open world that it's like it doesn't feel too long to get from place to place. And then also while you're swinging along you'll so commonly just see something on the side you're like, oh I'm gonna go do that actually and then you just go do it. And then while you're doing that thing, you run into another thing. You're like, oh, I'm going to go grab that. And then it's just like an hour later, you're like, oh, wait, I actually yeah. haven't touched the main quest yet. So yeah. maybe I should go do that. Yeah, yeah. this I is also- on my list, too. Uh, and everything Gene said, but like I just the wingsuit. I when the when or the web suit when they first showed the web wings, like yeah, I didn't so know. Cool. I didn't know how much I was going to love those. I was like, oh, that's yeah. that's a cool novelty. I'm going to dabble with here and there but they really helped build the city around using them and just made them a lot of a lot of fun to play with yeah Yeah, there's a there's a trophy for like flying from one end of the map to the next with just web wings basically and that was surprisingly Mm -hmm. fun to figure out how to do yeah yeah like everybody keeps saying it invalidates the swinging but i was still swinging just about as much as i was using the web wings like everybody's like there's slip streams everywhere i was like there's not slip streams everywhere what are you guys even smoking like they're they're slip streams placed in tactical areas to help you get across the map a little quicker but like to get on the little off beaten paths and stuff to go collect the robots or do whatever else you need to do like you still had to swing just about as much as you had to use the web suit and like using them together (laughs) is a really good experience so to me it was just like pure plus that they added it yeah i think this is one of the only games in a while that i've wanted five to 10 more hours uh, yeah. dedicated back to the story. Yeah. Um, probably five more hours added back into the main story of just more character motivation progression. Like, I want to see Peter's darkness grow a little bit slower. Yeah. Uh, give me a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it was a little like... And then the switch and back. Was- uh, I guess spoilers. But like some of the kind of the motivations to get out um to be a little bit slower and Mm -hmm. maybe like two or three more missions not even five more hours it's Uh, kind of like they do do a lot of their own stuff with the spider-man story but it's a little hard to spoil a spider-man story at this point (laughs) right right, right, right. 
right. Yeah, I it think is, it is exactly what you think it is for the most part. Yeah. It can be hard to find that balance. I think they're worried as they add more characters, right? That they're like, it's so easy to let something like a uh, gameplay time overrun when you've got multiple characters you're playing as oh, and yeah. not just one. So I'm glad they're careful with it. But yeah, I could I could I could have dealt with a couple few more missions in this game to let things breathe just a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and like that's the beginning. The game is kind of slow. Way. And then the end of the game, like the last half, it like goes very quick into like everything. Yeah. It's like very crazy how quickly it goes through. I, I still think it was paced well for the most part. It just yeah, yeah, could have used yeah. maybe a little, a few extra little missions here and there to help, like massage it a little out, bit like, differently. Yeah. yeah, just like ease stuff in just a little bit more or whatever. And I think now that I'm like thinking on it, it's a little bit funny to. I wonder if you were to take out all the gameplay and only do. I'm sure there's like an MK Ice and Fire. What's the? Yeah. yeah. Um, the YouTube channel. I'm sure that, that there's a mm. yeah, just a condensed version. I wonder how long the cutscenes are. Um, but I mean, if you're looking at something that is still longer than a full length movie, and you're expecting to get this full arc of Peter's like emotional yeah. full arc along with Miles, and you do get all of that, of course you're going to have it condensed, and just the amount of work, like you were saying at the beginning, Gene, like. The amount of production value that goes into every single one of these cutscenes, yeah, is it's like crazy. It's also <laughs> like so probably the, the best for iteration of Venom we've had in a video game, like ever yeah, for the agreed. most part. Like, and then just like the, even the teaser ending or whatever, where they can potentially go for the third one was pretty cool. As far as like one of the mystery Spider Men, like all that stuff. Like, I didn't even know who that person was and i had to go look it up because i only know them by their spider-man name but like just like where they're teasing they're gonna go is pretty cool overall so and then i liked where the story actually ended as far as like what happened so it's just the whole game as as a whole is really good so solid yeah yeah it's really good it's yeah it's on my list as well um a couple things we we didn't mention you you never have to use it in the Spider-Man games. I don't fast travel, but the fast travel in this game is the best fast travel oh, in any game ever. You can literally like you fast travel to any spots just, on the map yeah, and you will teleport yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like almost instantly. It yeah. was like and to the point people were theorizing that you pushing and holding the button was like a hidden load screen. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. But OK, <sighs> yeah, like, what? That doesn't yeah, people sense. were like one of the podcasts they even asked the developer though they were like is this a hidden load screen pushing and holding the x button it's like but what if they stop holding the button (laughs) like that doesn't even make sense but like you do that i did it once just to see what it looked like because everybody was talking about it it's just like you're almost instantly just like your character just drops in and is exactly where you put your ping or whatever it's like crazy um yeah, and then also the fact that you you play as both Spider Man in this game, and it is never like jarring switching between them because their play styles are mm-hmm. like how you play them is very similar, even though they've managed to make them feel significantly different with like their special. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's a very impressive game. Um, Ryan, what's your number four? My number four, Spider Man Two. Gene, Whoa, you know me? yeah, nice. Wow. <laughs> well. Preston, my number four is Resident Evil 4 Remake. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> right. Let's go to your number three. Spider-Man 2. Whoa. Hey. My number three is Hi-Fi Rush, which uh, I don't know who all else played. I think Chris did at least, but um, yeah, it's so freaking good. Like just Devil May Cry 80s cart- 80s slash 90s cartoon set to music. Like pretty much just everything I would want out of a video game. Like music just all worked really well. The characters are like absurdly fun. The challenging aspects of it are all really good. They have like a cool, like tower mode that you can go through. Like, and the combat as a whole, is just really fun. The only thing that kind of sucked is like, because it's so attached to the music, like you really have to make sure your soundbar delay is either non-existent or you need to hook up some headphones because like playing on the soundbar, I was like, why the fuck am I getting D ranks on like literally everything? I feel like I'm hitting it to the B. Mm-hmm. And then I plugged in my headphones. And I was like, 
oh, now it's all like A and S ranks on every fight. Oh, that's because now I'm actually in time with the beat rather than what my sound bar yeah. is putting out. But um, just as a whole, the game just like, it was out of left field too. They were just like, oh, look at this new game we're working on and it's out right now. Did like, shadow drop? It, yeah, yeah it shadow got dropped shadow it. dropped like the same day that they talked about it. And also the fact that it's a studio that's been making the Evil Within or whatever. And then suddenly they make this and it's also only $30 on Steam. Another one of those games that's on Steam just kind of proving like, I was like, oh, Game Pass is going to kill sales. And then the game just sells ridiculously well anyway, like Pal World is doing right yeah. now, like 8 million sales on fucking Steam, even though it's on Game Pass PC too. It's like, it just came out and proved a lot of the concept of like, why Game Pass can be a pretty good thing. And also why single player games aren't dead and they also don't have to cost 60 or 70 dollars like this game lasts about as long as a devil may cry game which costs 60 dollars and it's like 30 it's just like a whole good ass package and it's like i think we legitimately came about because like one or two of the developers were just like this is what i want to do and like the whole studio and xbox was just like yeah that makes sense just go do it yeah. and then they did it like <laughs> Which is what game design should be for the most part. So, yeah, I like the art style and the characters and stuff in the game. Um, the action was not as amazing for me. I think I think I might have played it on speakers, and that would probably be why. I don't know. I also just have like a terrible sense of rhythm. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it didn't it didn't do as much for me, but I I enjoyed it and I appreciate it, and I'll be excited yeah. if there's a sequel or whatever. You know? Yeah. I know I played it on pretty much the hardest difficulties and I got really close to the platinum. It's just like, or the not platinum, but what Xbox is rumored to want to get into a, having an actual platinum name. So supposedly the, within the this year, they're, yeah, Remember. supposedly within this year, they're supposed to be revamping it and actually having a system of some sort. So that way Xbox people can actually be like, Oh, I got every achievement. Like, cause it's so nice to just be able to say you platinum it. But I almost got to that point. Most games I tend to, not to just because like even whenever i get close i just always end up falling off eventually because there's a few that it's just like that's i don't care anymore <laughs> like chris was saying earlier but uh games really fun to just replay and uh they it's just really fun and there's not a whole lot to say about it legitimately just devil may cry 80s cartoon cells shading music like and the characters feel really good like a 80s cartoon basically like there's it's just really good. Sweet. Ryan, your number three. My number three is Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Nice. Wow. My number three, Let's... me and you, Preston. Right or die, man. Spider Man 2. Hell yeah. <laughs> My number two, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Whoa. Genetic. <laughs> My number two is the one that you guys all took off your list. It's Final Fantasy 16. I never um, even made it. That didn't, I didn't have to take it off because it like, Oh, no, Preston top. almost had it. <laughs> yeah, I actually just really enjoyed it. But I also, again, like I just said with Hi-Fi Rush, uh, Devil May Cry is like one of my favorite series overall. And this game, they stole the lead developer of the combat in Devil May Cry. And it's just in Final Fantasy, which is one of my favorite franchises too. So the game as a whole just they worked made. for me. And like... For me personally, like the story does get a little wonky towards the last part of it, but it's still just Final Fantasy bullshit, usual nonsense. I think the issue is just like they were setting up so much like it's going to be Game of the Thrones, more adult, not as yeah. Final Fantasy bullshit. Yeah. And then it suddenly changes into Final Fantasy bullshit. Yeah, they but throw like, away all the political intrigue at a point in the story. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Which is weird. It's very weird. But like I was kind of expecting it because it's like, you know, I've played through all the Kingdom Hearts games. I've played through most of the Final Fantasy games, like even games like Final Fantasy 12 and like even Tales games and stuff do it with like slavery is always in those games and shit. And then eventually they always just like, there's like, whoa, it was always this hidden super character that's actually evil. And now it's bullshit. Like, so I was expecting that to come. And then it did come and it was just like, I was still fine with it overall. I think that they could have done more with the story by the end of it, but like, I just really enjoyed the game as a whole. The combat feels really good. The biggest issue with gameplay is just like, they tried to hold on to, oh, it's an RPG, but like, there's no actual RPG elements. It's just like, 
oh, I got a slightly better sword. Let's throw that on. Oh, I got a slightly better sword. Let's throw that on. Like the icon abilities are like sort of RPG investments a little bit. But again, that's still similar to just like what Devil May Cry does, where it's like the shop comes up and you buy some stuff from the shop to improve your character. And then that's about it. So it's like it's better in devil may cry because you're buying stuff for your character that's like everything you buy for your character you're using is accessible there's yeah. so much stuff you like once you pick your build or whatever in final fantasy 16 there's no point in ever buying anything else because you can't I put mean, it on you do get to the point where you can start swapping skills and like mixing and matching so like yeah. you can have the root on with titan and something else and like you can you have the really root main bro. skill yeah like I still had like does. millions of extra XP beyond maxing out like a build of like switching between all those four skills. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Final Fantasy 16 is a game I was really excited about and it's not on my list because for me, it like it felt really flat. First of all, with the story, like um, character motivations become really like foggy and inexplicable. And then also it's just like, yeah, they throw away all the political drama. It's out of point. And it sucks. Um, but then also like the combat's not anywhere near as good for me as like a devil may cry like it feels it feels more button mashy at the beginning than devil may cry does from the very beginning devil may cry feels very combo focused and it takes a long time for this to get there but then it's combo focused for a little while and then it becomes cooldown management like you're just i you i used my skill i use my other skill swap i use my skill i use my other skill now i'm gonna mash square for like a minute so that i can reuse all my skills again yep. like it, it that's what the game became for me and i, I just i fell yeah, out of I love know. with it by I'm... the end I wasn't really feeling that too much myself. And like, I've even watched combo videos online and stuff and the systems just, they get really intricate if you actually want to try. And that's usually what I tend to be doing is like a whole bunch of experimentation in these games and swapping stuff around like a whole bunch. Like I try, I swapped through pretty much every idol or icon. I used almost every skill, like throughout the process of playing through the game and i still want to replay it to try out even more and like actually get into the dlc that they just released although uh, i don't know why the dlc is like 30 dollars or some shit i think i saw like i think seen i thought the one they released is free but like the one that's oh maybe i was seeing the pre-order for the next one yeah which the next the the official one or whatever that's supposed to cost money is supposed to get into like why leviathan was just like mysteriously missing or whatever um but yeah, I mean, I just like the game. The graphics are really good. The music's really good. Just like oh, everything yeah. about it just clicked well yeah, for me. Like, incredible. Yeah, yeah. The, pretty much. And then like the main thing for me was just like story gets a little wonky, but it's just the same usual Tetsuya Nomura freaking Final Fantasy Kingdom Hearts type bullshit. So I was like, eh, whatever. It doesn't yeah. matter that much. Yeah, it's, it's the same like... um story director is final fantasy 14 i think people are saying and everyone's like final fantasy 14 is one of the greatest stories of all time if you just play it for 700 hours or whatever but like i i guess i haven't heard from any of those people if this lives up to that but if if this is like the quality like uh, it's not worth the 700 hours to put in final fantasy 14 yeah. i mean i hear from everybody i think the issue probably would be that like final What's fantasy that? 14 they release the expansions and everything and then they, throughout the whole time they constantly release more to the expansion more dungeons and stuff and then i think it takes several patches before the story is actually finished and in a given expansion so there's more time to breathe and let it conceptualize i think there is a world where the where they could have the political intrigue and make the like cosmo bullshit at the end actually meld in a way that makes some sense like Tales of the Tales games, while they deal with the slavery and they get into like cosmic bullshit towards the end, they always have felt a little more like a cohesive story that makes that work. Yeah. Like, so I feel like there is a world where they could have done that. It's just like it's slavery, 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 like all this stuff about the magic and political intrigue and stuff. And then you fight Titan and then you hear Bartholomew or whatever the fuck his name was. I can't even remember at this point, but oh, the guy that's Odin, basically, he starts talking about, you know, the guy who you saw a few times prior. But then at that point, that's like the only focus is how to fight that guy. And it just like loses all the political parts of it for the most part. So it's it's a little weirdly constructed, but I think a large part of it is you had an MMO team that's very focused on a game that's pretty traditional final fantasy as far as the mmo goes 
they worked on a story for an action game that's supposed to only last about as long as like a devil may cry maybe a little bit longer or whatever which it did does go significantly longer but it the cutscenes themselves are probably about the they're still probably again longer than devil may cry but they were trying to get like devil may cry feel to attract a casual audience but then like they just flubbed it up somewhere that's what it feels like anyway yeah and i i also i would have i think i would like the game more if it was more like Devil May Cry in that it's like it was linear and level based. They have like yeah. these open areas that are like empty for it's no reason weird. with bad it's side weird. quests. Yeah. yeah, it's very weird. It very feel much feels like a a tech demo into like what they could potentially be doing in the future, rather than just like they knew exactly what they were doing. Because I think this is like the first project that the guy from Capcom did for them too. So and it's like the combat does work for the most part, and it's like. It was probably one of his first dips into like RPG, RPGifying his usual like this is what I do for Devil May Cry. So it's probably just like a growing yeah. pain for the most part. Hopefully, like if they do continue in this direction, which I I don't really see a point why they wouldn't because they have Bravely Default and um, Octopath Traveler, which honestly just and dragon's quest although we have no idea what where dragon's quest 12 is going yet but um they have turn-based traditional stuff that feels like it's a final fantasy just not officially called final fantasy so i don't see why they want to continue taking the mainline franchise in the direction of where like the casual appeal is because as everybody has talked about on here several times already like oh it's only a 20-ish hour game that's very nice like Final Fantasy games in the past aren't 20 ish hours. So well, I mean, I feel one through like, like gonna... six or something are still like 20 ish hours. But yeah, like Which I, I think like I mean, one through oh, the like old six ones? Yeah, or the whatever. Old, the old, yeah. old ones where 20 hours was like a long game back then, yeah. it felt like. Yeah. But then like from seven onwards, it's like 40, 50, 60, which this one was still long if you partook in a lot of the side content. But I feel like if I just gunned it, I could probably get it through in like 20 hours. But I just nice. I like any, the game overall. So, any more thoughts on Final Fantasy? Okay, Ryan, what's your? Uh, my number two is Jedi Survivor. Yeah. Wow, hey. nice. Nice. My <laughs> number two is Darkest Dungeon Two. I played a hundred and thirty hours of this you? game. A Darkest Dungeon fan? Yeah, I am yeah. indeed. I, I, know you are. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I adore this game. Um, it is. It is one of the most clever games at crafting a turn-based system that feels like a constant struggle, but you can overcome it. Um, this one is like, uh, compared to the first game, the first game can feel very grindy because it is like, it is a long campaign yeah. as opposed to like a roguelike. This one, a run is pretty lengthy for a roguelike. I think it's like an hour or two. Like if you get, once you get used to the mechanics, you probably get down to like 40 minutes to an hour, I guess. Um, but uh like because it is a roguelike, it doesn't feel super grindy. Like you could beat your first run, like you could beat the first part of the campaign. There's like basically five, five end bosses that you're you're like working through. So five runs that you have have to win, and you could beat the first run on your first go. Um, if you, you know, we're good. <laughs> um, but then yeah, every time you fail, you get you know you get candles that you spend to upgrade. You get new characters, you upgrade your characters, you get new equipment and new trinkets that you can find and stuff like that. Um. And yeah, it's just like a really, really <laughs> addicting loop. And it's really fun to create combinations. You know, I talked a little bit with Octopath Travel 2 about um, creating like really broken combinations of characters. You probably won't find broken combinations of characters here because the game is meant to be somewhat oppressive. But you will find like really interesting combinations. It's like the character that seems like it's very obviously a tank. It's like, well, what if I put these specific skills on in this like subclass and I put them in the back line? And then he's just like barking orders at my team and giving them buffs and it completely like changes the way you play the game. One that I just started playing with like um, this year actually because the DLC came out at the end of last year that had a couple characters. I started playing with Jester who has like a subclass where all of his songs, he has a bunch of songs that like buff his teammates and move them around. And all of his songs um, have like it will give your characters bleed so they will take damage over time but it will also give them like a random buff. Uh, which sounds like um, too big of a negative for the positive because a random buff you're going to get for one turn, the bleed's going to last for three turns. But you can buy like a berserker class or something. There are there is like a berserker class. I didn't actually use it with her at all, though. I used it with the um, like the 
fire starter class that has a cauterize ability that heals a significant amount, but only if the target is bleeding, which uh, is an amazing combination that I had not thought about last year. Um, and I'm just constantly finding new combinations like that. Um, it's very rewarding. All the characters have like their individual stories as well that you work through and you get new skills as you're working through those stories. You always feel like you're earning something new. Even though I played 130 hours, there is still one class that I'm missing a handful of skills for and I'm still missing like some trinkets and combat items and stuff like that. There's so, so much content in the game. Um, and it is it is one of the most rewarding challenges of the year if you're up for it, but I absolutely understand that it is it is an oppressively difficult game at times, um, and it can be very difficult to overcome that. Uh, definitely, it's a great game to have like a, a shirt before. I watched a lot of like streams, Dantac streaming the game before I started playing it, which I think was helpful. Mm, okay, that, I was just about to ask about that because I can get very frustrated and I'll stop a game. Um, but this does the roguelike nature of it does make me more inclined to pick it up because i could have a bad run but i could have a good run i don't i won't feel committed like if it's campaign yeah. style yeah. yeah failing a run has like almost no negative consequences you don't just you don't get as much candles or whatever and there's like there's a system they have in place where your characters if they survive a run you can use them in the next run but they have very minimal advantages like it doesn't matter that much if they die whereas in darkest dungeon one like if you get to the end of the game and you have a run where your level six heroes all die, that's like you just lost 20 hours of progress. Like that, that's way more, way more defeating uh, than it is in Darkest Dungeon. Yeah. I'm going to pick it up off recommendation. Sweet. Check it out. Hit me up if you have any or anything. Um, move on to our number ones. Preston. Uh, Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> I think it that much. Don't make me drive back to, to Maryland. <laughs> I was about to have to shit all over your number one, man. Just to slap you. <laughs> I know, right? Did my... not beat Alan Wake 2. But uh, yeah, Baldur's Gate 3, easy. Uh, by a country mile. A country mile, oh god. Country mile. S yeah, not yeah. city mile. They're different. Genetics, what's your number one? Mine is Sea of Stars. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you like you, you like forgot to you forgot <laughs> it on know. the list and then it's like, your number one. That's crazy. Well, because I had to make the list like literally today. And so I was like sitting here like I know, I fucking know something's <laughs> missing. And my issue was that I was looking through everyone's list of like releases in 2023, and they're all just like these stupid little bullet point lists. So I was scrolling through a whole year of video game releases. And then it just like, I don't, I feel like it's not on some of them, but just overlooking it. Yeah. Just like overlooked it a few times whenever I was looking and then like, but the whole time something was scratching the back of my head. Just like, <laughs> you are missing fucking something. <laughs> I think it's just like, it kind of like everybody loves the game, but it's like, it kind of came and went. It feels like it got like jam packed into a few other games, I think. And so oh, it's yeah. like, and then Didn't it also it got. Out? same week as Baldur's Gate? I think it or Starfield did. Maybe? It came out very close to like a few other things. I don't know where exactly it came out, but it just like didn't have nearly enough press, not as much, many people talking about it. It's like the people that you know will be talking about it, are the main ones that talked about it. It didn't get talked about outside of that, really. And then um, but I also feel like it got overshadowed a little bit by all that completionist drama, but uh, because he oh, yeah, was a was... cameo in the game, but, but that wasn't that's until, not like, long something to dive after into. its release, right? That was a fair that's bit after its release, right? but I feel like it just like it muddies the waters a little bit more because this game was pushed out by him so much. So, um, anybody that I did know that was talking about it started talking about that more so, and then like the news cycle became, oh, they actually removed him as a cameo from the game because of all the nonsense. But I mean, I feel like if anything, the game just got more press than any other indie game because of it which i mean because of that i know right, it's like technically think, but... bad press but not it's not really bad press. it's not like not oh, the game's yeah, doing something really, wrong it's bad it's press for the completion is right yeah um, exactly so but i feel like it just like there was just too much towards the end of the year that just like jam-packed it out of my focus whenever i was sitting there trying to look through a list and recall but the second i wasn't looking at the list i was like looking at just my own list i was like i know fucking something's missing here and then I very quickly realized what it was, and then I just took Dave the Diver off. 
Because yeah. that was just like, a, I'm randomly adding this because I know I enjoyed it a lot, but I can't seem to come up with what the yeah. last game was. But yeah. then it was Sea of Stars, which yeah. I mean, again, Sea of Stars, it's like the last five on my list are always very contentious with each other, it feels like. so. Yeah, so Baldur's Gate 3 released on August 3rd and Sea of Stars is August 29th. I feel like anything that released in the following three months of Baldur's Gate 3 got yeah, overshadowed. Basically, <laughs> that's probably yeah. it, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> probably the main reason why. Because I've probably seen and heard, a, I mean, I have seen and heard a lot of Baldur's Gate 3 content because I do follow several people that just play that like exclusively at this point. But like, just it sea of stars isn't wasn't in anyone's content cycle besides like oh i'm gonna get out a, a quick review on this or whatever so it's just like yeah i, I mean it, it, got a, much... it got a good amount of coverage but like yeah it didn't get like it like, got coverage as far as like reviews and like game informer i think had it on its cover and stuff but there wasn't like i don't know not social media staying power to it or something there was a point where my mind immediately think... recalled it whenever in one day i'm trying to yeah. recall all the games from 2023 99 percent of games don't have social media stay beyond a week anymore though like uh Unless Baldur's Gate 3 and like Elden yeah. Ring and recent memory are like some that have like that kind of staying power but very few do well then like even so after the game awards the controversy was like oh how did Baldur's Gate 3 win game of the year when you have this and it's like because Spider-Man 2 is pretty much just a playable movie <laughs> <laughs> like as yeah. good as the game is like that was the whole controversy after the game awards besides obviously shooing the developers off pretty quickly but like see the, even that stuff it's just like the whole gaming news sphere on that last half of the year just like pushed everything else from the year out of my mind it was just like trying to recall it in one day was like crazy yeah um all right you're number one ryan surprise us all Surprise, my number one tiny little indie game. Probably haven't heard of it. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3. No way. <laughs> Never heard of it. Is indie game. <laughs> it is technically an indie. Also, it, it's really weird that like none of the people that made Baldur's Gate 3 happen are still at the studio. Like the people that made the deals to make that game happen are there anymore because mm. of layoffs. It's it's gross. Our industry is gross. Um, Wait, at Larian or yeah, Larian Wizards or no, at Wizards of the Coast. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I don't oh, know. Okay. Yeah, they're recently yeah. at Wizards of the Coast, and all the people that like were say. contact in contact with Larian to make that deal happen. Or, um, yeah. yeah, my number one is Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Nice. Revitalized my love of Zelda. Wow. Um, oh, I think yeah. that's the main reason why it's like my number one is because it was my favorite series of all time for a long time, and Breath of the Wild brought it down pretty hard for me and this this game really revitalized how much i love it so. yeah those are top 10 lists thanks everybody for joining no problem thank you oh yeah uh any quick honorable mentions yes. quick i got like two i have several but battle bit remastered quickly. battle bit remastered oh. which was just roblox battlefield that dropped in the middle of the summer in a, in a bit bit of a gap it felt just like battlefield three and four i was so happy uh and what was the other one? Oh, king of the castle that little yeah. that mobile game where like one person's a king and everyone's like a a part group of a politics. fiefdom yeah yeah group politics it was just fun it was, it was good times yeah, press yeah the i game had um uh it's king of the castle was on mine and war tales uh mm -hmm. ryan and i played some war tales where you are your little band of roving mercenaries and you grow and it's a tactical uh group and it, it's got great multiplayer um really really fun and uh actually alan wake 2 i didn't beat it but and there's a lot wrong with it i think but man is it a good looking and interesting enough game i just don't like the gameplay yeah it's interesting just the gameplay like it feels very much like a resident evil game early on and then you just get excessive like supplies and doesn't feel like a survival horror game it just feels like a exactly um, yeah yeah my honorable mentions i have the dead space remake um really great remake but it's it's just i mean it feels very much like what you remember that game being it doesn't feel like a, like a complete reimagining or anything uh theater rhythm final bar line final fantasy music's amazing you get to play along with it great uh like a dragon Ishin and like a dragon gaiden like a dragon gaiden has one of the best endings in a video game um if you're if you're going to play like a dragon infinite wealth you should watch the ending to like a dragon guy 
Um, <laughs> Should I watch it anyway? Regardless, yes, because it's really good. I think even knowing absolutely nothing about Like a Dragon or its characters, I think that ending will be affecting for you. Um, and then Ishin is just like Stan Feudal Japan, it's cool. Pikmin 4 uh, and Super Mario RPG. Uh, Thont, I uh, had an honorable mentions. And Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp. Those are all my own. Uh, mine was pretty much like games that I did actually play that are honorable mentions. It's pretty much just Tears of the Kingdom and Diablo 4 and Nickelodeon All Stars Brawl 2 because it fixed everything that was wrong with the first one, even though the first one was pretty good. And then ones that I didn't get a chance to play, but it's like I know based off of developer creed or whatever else that I would probably enjoy it was. It's actually fairly long. There's just too much shit. Yeah. <laughs> but it's Fire Emblem Engage, Mage Seeker, which is a top-down like uh, League of Legends story, Song of Nunu, which is like a platformer League of Legends story, uh, Dragon Quest Monsters, The Dark Prince, Remnant 2, Disney's Illusion Island, Baldur's Gate 3, Wayfinder, Myth Force, Party Animals, Wargroove 2, Mario Wonder, Sonic Superstars, Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora, Tactica, or Persona 5 Tactica, Polya, and Lies of P. Those are pretty much the ones that I either only got to play like an hour or I just didn't get to them in time. Yeah, but, I've definitely I got a long list of ones that I, I didn't get to and may have potentially made this list. I will say a couple of ones on your list, I, I'll shout out at least Fire Emblem Gage is like but the least good Fire Emblem game in a long time. <laughs> that's what, the, that's what I, don't I think heard it's worth too, playing, but honestly. it still had a chance as far as like the bottom bottom set of the list goes. The writing like is the just top, terrible. Yeah, the top was pretty locked in for the top five, but the bottom five could probably, I would have probably argued with myself had I played at several of these for longer than I did or actually been able to get around to them. Like most of them are just like, I'm going to wait for a sale or something. A handful of a solid handful of them are actually on Game Pass right now too. So there's just no time. Too many live service, too many games, too many things. Yeah. Um I did I had I had one dishonorable mention. I wanna shout out One Piece Odyssey is the worst game. Yeah, <laughs> sucks so hard. One Piece Odyssey. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I Was forgot it really that bad? It is it's so bad. It's almost as bad as Chris Dale's. Really? Um, yeah. yeah, not good That's game. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, yeah with that, I guess I didn't hear much about that one except for the fact that you guys were doing it. I didn't yeah. hear shit from anybody. That's probably more shit than you should have heard about it, honestly. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can go listen to our game exploration on the channel if you want to you wanna yeah. hear why that game sucks. <laughs> it's so bad. Anyways, uh, those were our top 10 lists and honor mentions and all that stuff. Uh, Preston, anything you want to plug? I uh, draft punks were starting back to do some stuff. Uh, I think uh, someone was just on an episode recently that may be out, probably won't be out by the time this comes out, <laughs> but it's around this time. And then we should be doing a goatee draft as well. Oh, sweet. Uh, awesome. Genetics, do you have anything you want to put? Uh, just the usual youtube.com slash Victorian genetics. Uh, pretty much just reviews of games and stuff i am currently playing through like i'm currently playing through lightning returns uh strider and donkey kong country freeze or whatever because they all came out february of 10 years ago basically and um mm. so i'm putting out reviews on those hopefully it's it gets a little wonky because i'm also doing a grand blue fantasy relink uh Whoa. Holy crap. I had the stupid pineapple on pizza up on the side, and for some reason the game, the video just decided to start autoplaying. But like Relink, um, possibly Tekken 8. There's like a few other little videos that are probably going to be sprinkled in there, but there's just going to be like a whole bunch of shit getting posted, basically, because I did post like a solid five or six videos last year that were basically along the same lines, just new stuff and everything. But that's pretty much it. I, like, I haven't done Twitch in a while yet. I don't know if I'm going to or when. I just kind of like YouTube fits better with the there's a bunch of shit going on all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Grinder's great. Tropical Freeze is great. Lightning Returns, not so much. Spoilers. Did you actually play it? Yeah, I did. Um, oh. Final Fantasy Thirteen trilogy so got worse with every entry. I, I guess mean, if I you like really like Lightning lot, but... and don't care about good writing, you appreciate Final Fantasy Thirteen. The writing's so bad mm. in that game, I think. I... Yeah, it's been questionable so far already, but it's fine for the most part as far as gameplay and stuff goes. Um, Chris and Ryan, y'all are uh, content machines right now. What? Are we? <laughs> I don't think we are. <laughs> machines. Farms. Two podcasts is not con- machines or farm. <laughs> Why? Yeah, Chris, do it. You guys got to do a got to rate them all for Pal World. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And then do cassette uh, beasts. <laughs> Ooh. And then do monster sanctuary. Yeah, you play cassette yeah. beasts. We could rank some cassette beasts. I'd be down for that. Yeah, why don't we why don't we just do all why don't we do Dragon Quest Monsters and uh we'll yeah. do with we'll the Digimon and we'll yeah. do uh no. Shimigami I Tensei. Draw line, I draw a line before Digimon. <laughs> <laughs> Digimon's so good though. Um but yeah, I mean you can find all our content at is youtube.com slash friendly fire. Games pod? Games? We should know this. I should have looked should. it up after we didn't know it yesterday. <laughs> when we recorded it. Come on. Uh, I'll find it real quick. But yeah, that's where we're doing. Friendly everything. Fire Games Pod. Yeah. YouTube.com yeah, yeah. slash at, at Friendly Fire friendly Games fire Pod. Games pod. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So check us out there. That's where we're also doing like uh, that's where Ryan is streaming Kingdom Hearts once he gets back to it and everything. And honestly, I'll, I'm probably going to move streaming into stream events and stuff to there too like we'll probably just stream from you just do it all on mm-hmm. youtube make life easy get easier i mean you can do multi as well nah just do it in one place <laughs> like, <laughs> i mean it, it just don't have to like, worry about uh well it's easier on the internet too because then you only have to upload to one site it splits well, yeah but, but but like the 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 future of discoverability t- technically is to stream to pretty much everywhere and then just have it all funnel into the YouTube. Yeah. But that's pretty much what most of people are doing. But that's not for what we need to do on podcast talk. We can just oh, say yeah, that podcast, right? right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> podcast specifically, yeah, that's true. Just like if you're streaming gameplay and stuff. Like especially TikTok. TikTok's so freaking huge for getting random discoverability and shit. Yeah, then YouTube Shorts. I keep hearing Preston kept telling me last year, like YouTube Shorts, man. That's really bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you pay attention to that sort of content, that of people like this is what you should be doing. It's that's pretty much always the same shtick. It's a yeah. subscriber driver. Yeah, it really does oh, yeah. help a little bit. But I just like I'm in the same boat as you guys. It's like hard to get into wanting to even bother with it. Yeah, but we'll be back at some point. We get a, we'll get those Pokemon DLCs played and we'll uh, put a list together or two. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I mean, like I'll be streaming industry events when I can and we mm-hmm. we will certainly do, you know, Modi and Godi again, if nothing else uh, this year. We, we really love doing these. Lists, so. Yeah. These are uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody who joined us. Thanks, Preston and Genetics. And uh, we'll see Peace you guys out. when we see you guys. Bye. Later. See you later. Peace out.